All right, what's good, y'all? Sorry, I'm a, just a little bit late. Just had to put some finishing touches on this uh, presentation here. Um, glad you can join us. Let me know you're live in the chat. I already see some people who are already here early. Um, enthralled by AOT, maybe you meant AOC. Yes, I am always enthralled by AOC. <laughs> um, yeah, Sunny Johnson would enjoy this subject. Hopefully I do her proud. Um, I'm not going to take too much time to get started because I'm going to tell you right now, we have a lot to cover, a lot. I put a lot of time into uh, preparing this for you guys, and um, it's going it, to it's gonna go into detail. It's going to get pretty deep, and believe it or not, as deep as this presentation gets, there is still far more detail that I had to leave out just because... I'm sure you guys don't want to spend all night with me. We'd probably go into tomorrow if I went over everything. But the good thing about, about that, though, is that I'm still going to be developing content on this subject, the subject that kind of fills in the blanks between what I'm presenting here, and that'll be uh, pr uh, given as bonus content. So um, before I get started, just want to remind you, if you're watching this, please share this video right now. Just hit that share button. I really appreciate it. That helps me out a lot. I want to get as many people watching this as possible live. Of course, they can always watch the replay, but it's kind of better to have, have it be more live as well. So please share. And if you're not already subscribed, please subscribe. Really appreciate it. Um, also, if you want to support my work, you can join my locals community. Um, the link to that is in the show notes. Um, it's at afreshperspective.locals.com. I will be putting more premium content on there, just like I mentioned, some bonus content that kind of fills in the blanks of what I'm doing here, also with more content as well. So it's only $4.99 per month, and it would help me out a lot. Become a subscriber. Hey, that's less than what you pay for a cup of, cup of coffee, right, at Starbucks, which, by the way, none of the, the Starbucks in my area are open yet. You can do the drive through but for some reason, they're still not opening. But I digress. Who cares? But also, if you want to do a one-time donation, there's links in the show, show notes as well, and there's links right here. Very much appreciate it. That funds what I do and helps me to, to produce even more content like this. So I'm going to pull up my information here. All right. Yes, Mika El Israel, it is an important topic, and I hope that you get a lot out of this. I think you will. I mean, because there's going to be a lot here that that most people on the right or the left don't really know about. Um, so I just want to, like I said, I'm going to warn you, this is going to be a very a dense presentation. It goes deep. I'm going to be uh, reading a lot of quotes from a few different books that I've been reading to research this subject. I'm not sure how much I'm going to be able to engage with the chats, but I am going to try to take some breaks to, you know, answer questions if you have them. But I really want to spend as much time on this as possible um, because, like I said, there is a lot here. This this will be longer than my normal live streams, I'm pretty sure. I could be wrong. I may just end up breezing through it, but I, I don't think that's the case because I, I got a lot of information, got a lot of quotes, and I did a lot of writing here. So first, before I get started, um, I want to explain why I'm doing this. Um, if you follow me for any amount of time, you know that this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart because one of my main priorities is getting the conservative, the conservative movement and the Republican Party to start engaging with black voters in a genuine and authentic way. Um, this hasn't been something that has happened on the right for a long, long time. So. I think we have a lot of work to do. I am seeing some positive signs. But the first reason is because understanding what happened in the past is going to help us better understand what, what is happening today. And as we go through this, you're going to hear a lot of stuff that sounds familiar, except the difference is that it happened 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. You're going to see that things, you know, nothing really changes under the sun, of course, unless we affect change you will see that the Republican Party is making a lot of the same mistakes today as it did back then. And it'll give you a better understanding of how this whole thing started. That way we can kind of understand the roots of this because most people don't understand the roots of the, the problems that the GOP has when it comes to attracting black votes. So that's the first reason. The second reason is to really help to change the misconception that right-wing people have about black people in the black community and why they don't vote for Republicans. 
I want to dispel the illusion that black Americans are mentally enslaved socialists, and that's why they voted Democrat. Uh, this presentation is going to de debunk that theory. Some of you already know why, but a lot don't, and they don't understand the history. This is not something that a lot of right-leaning commentators will talk about, but it's important. Um, and lastly, it's to help us figure out how to stop making the same mistakes and to start crafting new strategies that would actually work when it comes to getting more black votes. Um, I probably will be sipping from my magic water jug multiple times throughout this presentation. But um, here's some other points to understand before I get into the meat. Um, I'm going to tell you straight up, a lot of this is going to be negative uh, when it comes to the Republican Party. This isn't to bash the GOP, and nor is it a reflection on a lot of everyday conservatives that we see. And most people just don't know about this. But the, the bottom line is that the former party of Lincoln made some very blatantly bad decisions uh, when it comes to the black community all throughout its history. Uh, I, I know a lot of us like to talk about how the Republican Party freed the slaves and supported civil rights legislation. They always skip the part between the ending of slavery and the civil rights legislation, because there's a lot in the middle there that occurred that we don't know about. But even with the good thing is that it's done, there are specific decisions that the party made throughout its history, made by various leaders that drove black the black community into the arms of the Democrats. And the sooner we come to terms with that, the easier it will be for us to figure out how to, how to reverse course on this. Um, but as I'm talking about the bad decisions that the party made, it's very important, and I'm going to repeat this at various points throughout this presentation, it's important that we don't assume that the direction that the party chose uh, was not supported by all Republicans. Like, we shouldn't assume that this was, that these, the bad decisions that they made were largely supported on the right and within the Republican Party. In fact, all throughout this history, you're going to see that there are individuals, there are leaders, there are organiz organizations that fought vigorously against the direction that the party ended up going. Um, as a matter of fact, they still exist today. I'm one of them. Uh, but all throughout this history, there are people in the Republican Party who are saying, no, we need to go back to the party being the party of Lincoln. We don't need to go this direction. We shouldn't go this direction. And I'm going to continue to remind you of this throughout this video, because if you're a conservative and you're watching this, you, you need to know that. Like, that. like the stuff that I say, the stuff that you hear Sonny Johnson say, the stuff that you see Maj Ture say, this isn't new. There were always people like us throughout the history of the party. Unfortunately, up until now, they, they just lost the battle. Um, they had victories here and there. I'm not going to say they just completely lost, but overall, it was uh, certain people that won out. Um, the last thing I want you to know before I start is there is hope. Again, this is going to be a lot of negativity, but there there is hope. I have been very encouraged by the, a lot of the things that I'm seeing from conservatives, both black and white and otherwise. I think a lot of people are coming around. I think it'll still take more time and more education, but I'm seeing more and more people who are open to hearing something new. Um, I, I've been ha I haven't talked about this, but I've been having conversations behind the scenes with some pretty important people in the Republican Party. I've even been talking to other commentators like myself who may have one, one view of the situation, but they're open to hearing something more. Um, so I'll be making some appearances on, on their mediums, but um, I'm hoping to have more good news soon. But there, there are things happening behind the scenes that you just haven't seen yet. And hopefully those things come to fruition, especially this year, because it's important. This is something that we need to get on as soon as possible. Otherwise, if we wait too long, it might get to the point where it's too late. Okay, fair enough. All right. So get, get out your popcorn, get your coffee or your bourbon or whatever, or what have you. And let's get it going. So we were going to start when the Civil War was winding down. Uh, when the Civil War was winding down, President Lincoln uh, was cited was siding with a group known as the Radical Republicans. Um, the Radical Republicans were different from the anti-slavery crowd. Uh, you, you can refer to them as abolitionists. I mean, this included Frederick Douglass, it included black people and white people in the Republican Party 
who didn't, didn't think it was enough just to give slaves their freedom. They also wanted to give them full rights. They wanted to give them suffrage, the right to vote. And they wanted to get to give them all that right now, right in that moment. Whereas others adopted more of a gradualist view because they feared upsetting people and reigniting the war. Um, Lincoln actually endorsed the formation of the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, this was an office that was designed to help former slaves transition into a free life and help to set them up economically and otherwise. There's a lot of information on it. Now, I know Lincoln in general is kind of controversial with his views on race. I mean, there was a point in time where he wanted to help send black people back to Africa because he thought that would be better for them. But on the other hand, he also supported the Freedmen's Bureau, which didn't involve sending black people back to Africa. So it seems like he changed his mind a lot. I'm not sure where he ended up at the point when he died, but he, he's not, you know, for lack of a better term, it, it's not really a black and white history uh, with, with President Lincoln. So when I say things like the party of Lincoln or more accurately, the former party of Lincoln, I'm not talking about Lincoln per se. I'm talking about the people who existed under the time of Lincoln. Lincoln is the figurehead, but there were a lot of people who supported what he was doing and went even further than he did in wanting more for uh, freed slaves. That is the party that I'm talking about, and that is the party that I want to get back to. Not that black people are in slavery today, but they want they took their relationship with the black community after slavery was abolished. They took that relationship very, very, very seriously. They were all about black empowerment. They were about black excellence. They were about lifting black people up economically. Um, now, one of the reasons why the GOP's relationship with the black community at the time, it, it seemed like it would be short lived. And uh, there is a reason for that, especially after Lincoln died. So his vice president was Andrew Johnson. And even though he was opposed to the Confederacy, it didn't mean that he was, you know, a fan of, of black people having any kind of rights. Um, so if you see, here's a quote from Andrew Johnson. Um, and after Lincoln was killed, Andrew Johnson took over, like I said, and he was a virulent racist. He declared, this is a country for white men and by God, as long as I'm president, it shall be a government by white men. Um, so there were, let's see, the Freedmen's Bureau, it was a relatively small agency that still existed under Andrew Johnson. He didn't really get rid of it because this is something that was set up under Lincoln before his death. And it was, it was a small federal agency and it had about 900 different agents across the South. And they their job was to create procedures for contracts and rules between white landowners and their black workers or former slaves. And it was scheduled to exist for only one year after the war, but it could have been, but, but it could be renewed. And in January of 1866, the bill was passed pretty quickly. Um, it wasn't necessarily revolutionary, but it did kind of make it harder for white people to, to discriminate against former slaves. And the thing is, the Republicans thought that this bill, that, the, that President Andrew Johnson would endorse the bill. Um, so even though it went through Congress quickly, they were wrong about Andrew Johnson. Uh, he vetoed the bill. He also vetoed a Republican sponsored bill to protect the rights of freed slaves. This measure would have declared that black Americans were citizens of the United States and as such were entitled, entitled to the rights and privileges that come with that status. Uh, now, here's a good thing about it. Congress was able to override Andrew Johnson's veto. But imagine what it would have been like if they weren't able to do that. I mean, you'll see that it was already bad enough as it is. But if you were a freed slave and the Republican Party was wanted to be actively involved with helping you not only get your freedom, but to also set you up for prosperity. And then all of a sudden this gets struck down by the party that said that it wants to help you. It, it could not have been easy to be living under that time, right? I mean, if you kind of imagine that, there were plenty of Republicans who wanted to help, but people like Andrew Johnson weren't so keen on the idea. 
Um, so here's a quote, and this quote comes from a book called The Republicans, A History of the Grand Old Party. It's written by uh, Lewis Gould. And he says, quote, although the Republicans came out of the war with the luster of victory and an indelible link to the memory of the martyred Abraham Lincoln, the dozen years from 1865 to 1877 proved fateful for the party. Their policies on reconstruction left permanent changes in the constitution as the 14th and 15th amendments joined the 13th in defining the rights of former slaves under the law. However, the effort to create a viable Republican party in the South, despite some in initial successes, proved to be a transitory one. By 1877, the white Democratic South was on its way towards dominance in the region and the establishment of a one-party structure that would remain in place for 75 years. So what that is essentially saying is that what kind of set up this conflict is that after the war and right after Reconstruction, the Democratic Party established dominance over the South, and their dominance would last for 75 years. They had pretty much all control over it, but here's the thing, the, the GOP wanted to become more of a national party. It didn't want to just represent just the North. They wanted to have inroads in the South as well, and that is where the trouble starts. Not necessarily that they wanted to gain inroads in the South, but it was the methods to which they resorted that became an issue. And that leads us into the Lily White movement, which is something that people talk about a lot. So what is the Lily White movement? So before I get into this, I'm just gonna let you know, for this section, I'm gonna be quoting from a book called Republicans and the Black Vote by Michael K. Fontroy. I've recommended this book before. It's in the show notes. And um, I can actually put a link to where you can go buy it too. I didn't, I don't think I put that in there yet, but you have to get it from the publisher. You can't get it from Amazon or elsewhere, but I think it's only about 20, 25 bucks, but I would highly recommend picking that, that book up. A few of my followers have already done it. Very enlightening. So this, just to kind of sum up what the Lily White movement was, it was an effort that materialized in the Republican party shortly after the end of reconstruction. So we're talking like, in the 1870s, 1880s. Um, it was made up of Republican leaders who resented the fact that the GOP continued to cultivate its relationship with the black community. They felt that the GOP should focus more on courting white voters in the South, which became, which again, became heavily dominated by the Democratic Party. So, some of that should sound familiar. We've all heard of the Southern strategy, right? Which I'll be talking about in just a little bit. But the Southern strategy is in, in reality, it didn't start in the 60s and 70s, it started right after Reconstruction. So if you think about that, it only took about 10 to 15 years for the Republican Party to start making this move. Um, members of the Lily White movement in several Southern states began working to oust prominent black leaders in the Republican Party and to deliberately alienate black voters. This, th this was a concerted effort to turn the GOP into a, quote, lily white party that excluded minorities. Um, the, the, leg the legacy of this movement eventually culminated in the black exodus from the, from the former party of Lincoln to FDR's Democratic Party, although it didn't necessarily end with FDR's Democratic Party. There was still a little bit of back and forth, which I'll explain later. Um, but what happened was after reconstruction, after the Democrats got the South, um, Fontroy explains why they were able to, to gain the South, uh, quote, Democrats were successful for two reasons. First, they made overt racial appeals to the considerable racist hostility and anxiety that existed among whites during that period. Second, Republicans responded to the new competition by mimicking Democrats in hopes that they would maintain control of Southern governments. The appeal was simple. Democrats charged that the Republican Party was the party of the Negro and that it had to be crushed in order to return the South to its pre-Reconstruction white supremacist roots. He continues, Fontroy continues, the perception that the GOP was too supportive of black freedom and equality 
and its electoral implications became a political albatross for Republicans who began to fear being marginalized by the Democrats. So the GOP was afraid of being not, not being able to, to attain power in the South because they were viewed as the party of Black Americans. By the way, I will be using the word Negro a lot in this presentation because of the writings back then that that was a common word. So hopefully you're not too offended by that. Don't think you will be. And I have the right to say it anyway. So, <laughs> um, so the Republicans, in an effort to make more inroads in the South, started imitating what the Democrats were doing, appealing to white grievance, appealing to essentially to, to racism, to be blunt. And this allowed the party to start a shift. This allowed for the creation of the Lily White movement. Um, many Republicans were afraid that the label, the party of the Negro, would interfere with their efforts to take the party national. And they decided to deal with this issue by pulling back from black members of the party. Now, remember, like I said previously, black people were very much intertwined with the direction of the party. They had a lot of control over where the Republican Party was going. Again, there were plenty of black leaders in the Republican Party. Frederick Doug Douglass, to, for an example, Harriet Tubman became a leader in the, in the Republican Party. A, a lot of different black people did, um, especially ones who were elected to office. They were very much pushed by the party of Lincoln. But at this point, the Lily Whites came around and the shift created a schism that split Republican into two factions, the Lily Whites and the Black and Tans. And these two factions were warring against one another for control of the party. Um, unfortunately, at the, in the end, the Lily Whites got the upper hand. So to quote uh, Republicans in the, in, the black, in the black vote, quote, the Lily White faction represented white Republicans only, opposed black political participation, and supported the return of segregation and white supremacy. It was the product of conservative racist ideology and the quote, inherent demands and the customs of Southern lifestyles and occurred at a time when Republicans sought to expand their base of support into the South. It also emerged out of frustration with black control of many state Republican parties. As this short period of black control affected white access to patronage. And in many cases, Lily Whites worked with Democrats to, to disenfranchise African-Americans. Now, I'm going to stop right there and kind of explain what he's saying, saying as far as conservatives go. And he seems to have a left wing bent to this. So there is a few things that he says that I don't agree with. But there were multiple types of conservatives. Not all conservatives were racist back then. Um, but most of the racism at that time was in the South. And with the North, it could have been a little bit more hidden. It, it still exist, existed. Wasn't quite as brazen as it was in the South. But again, the Lily White faction was, was capitalizing on white Southerners' grievances. Uh, whites in the South were afraid of losing control, especially those who were involved with the Republican Party, because as Fontroy just mentioned, there were black people in charge of a lot of different state and local level Republican parties. Like I said, they were very much intertwined with the goings on in the GOP. So the Lily, the the conflict between the Lily Whites and the Black and Tans, which, by the way, the Black and Tans also included white people as well, but they didn't want their party to only be white. And this battle occurred in several southern states, uh, Texas, North Carolina, Louisiana. Um, most of the southern states had this conflict going on. And in, and in some cases, this conflict even lasted into the 60s. Um, but for this presentation, I'm going to focus on the one that occurred here where I am in Texas. And, and the cool thing about this is that the Texas State Historical Association has kept records of this. So it's easy to find and kind of see the story of what happened. So, but I want you to view what happened in Texas as sort of a, um, sort of kind of a, a microcosm of what happened in other states as well. Because like I said, this was a huge political battle. Um, <clears throat> let me go ahead and... Uh, one second. Okay. So what happened with the Texas Republican Party right after Reconstruction, right after Re Reconstruction ended, is a prime example of the battle for the soul of the party. And in Texas, it started when Edmund J. Davis was elected governor. Um, let me 
put that up here. So again, these quotes are going to be from the Texas State Historical Association. And I have a link to that in the show notes, I believe. Yeah, let's do that one. I can see it better. Um, the election of Edmund J. Davis, a white radical, as governor in 1869, gave blacks additional influence, as did the election of two black state senators, G.T. Ruby and Matthew Gaines, a minister and former slave and 12 representatives to this 12th legislature. Um, so Edmund J. Davis was very much down with, with promoting the black community and trying to you know, get freed slaves into a better position. Um, Reconstruction, here's another quote. A reconstruction ended in 1873 with the defeat of Davis, an event hailed by a former governor as the restoration of white supremacy and democratic rule. The number of blacks in the legislature dropped and white Democrats be, began reestablishing control of Texas politics. Now here's something that's interesting. The Texas Republican party, and, and this will be mentioned later, was 95% black. <laughs> Think about that. Like I, I can't even imagine that being the case today. I mean, obviously with the demographic, demographic changes, that wouldn't be the case. But even having a Democratic party, or I'm sorry, a Republican party that was mostly black, it's almost unthinkable. But back then in Texas, that was a case. So here's another quote. Quote, in a state now controlled by white Democrats, African-Americans experimented with three options. One was involve, involvement in the Republican Party. Another was an alliance with factions of Democrats or a collaboration with the third party. And one thing I want, want to mention about Democrats here too is like I said about the Republicans, there are always people trying to push back against the Republicans going the way that it did. The same is actually true of Democrats. There were Democrats who weren't down, were, who weren't down with, with segregation or, or racism and things like that. They, they may, it may have been fewer in the Democratic Party, but they did exist. So there were black people who tried to, to link up with them to, to, to kind of promote some type of progress. Um, of course, it was difficult because at this point you had the Republican Party and the Democratic Party vying more for Southern white votes. And as you'll see, this left African-Americans feeling a little bit politically homeless. Um, the, the, the percentage of black people in Texas declined from 31% to 20% of the population between 1870 and 1900. This was largely because of the fact that the white Democrats took over. Um, quote, African-American activity in the Republican Party focused on preventing the conservative faction from gaining control and driving out blacks, who in the 1880s formed 90% of the party's membership. I was wrong, it was 90%, not 95%. Uh, by attracting like-minded whites, conservative Republicans hope to compete effectively with the Democrats. Now, at this point in time, you had a black Republican leader named um, Norris Wright Cooney. Here's a picture of him. Um, and he had kind of come up through the ranks and he ended up being appointed as the president of the Galveston Union League. Now, the Union League is very interesting. I would have liked to have dove more into what that was, and maybe I will at a later point. But to put it simply, the Union League, it started out as a secret organization that was created in 1863 to support President Lincoln and to promote morale and unity among members of the Union. So these people were acting in secret to promote Lincoln's agenda as far as um, um, ending slavery. Um, now, the 1892 election proved to be a turning point for both GOP factions, so for both the Lily Whites and the Black and Tans. And Cooney aligned the Black and Tans behind uh, George... Oh, wait, no, that's not true. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So Cooney aligned the Black and Tans behind George Clark. Um, I guess he was a conservative Democrat, but maybe different in his fight. And he, they promoted him in his fight against James S. Hogg. The Lily Whites nominated Andrew Jackson Houston for the governorship. Now, Andrew Jackson Houston was a son of Sam Houston, and he ended up becoming a U.S. Senator. But in this election, he only received 1,322 votes in the November election. Um, 
so this provided a setback to Cooney and the Black and Tans because their candidate was defeated. And on top of that, uh, Grover Cleveland, who was the Democrat governor of, or I'm sorry, the, the Democrat nominee for president, he won. So that means that not only did his candidate, which would have favored the Black and Tans, was defeated, but a Democrat took office in the White House. So Cooney didn't even have any federal patronage. Um, his predecessor, I believe it was Benjamin Harrison, was very much supportive of Black involvement in the GOP. So now he lost two important uh, supporters. Um, the thing is, is that Southern Republican leaders, both Black and white, um, this is according to the Texas State Historical Association, they both relied on the on federal jobs to maintain their state organizations. So when Cooney lost out under Cleveland, this opened the door for a lily white takeover. Um, to make matters worse, um, after Cooney was replaced as national committeeman, there was a little bit of infighting as to who would take his place. Um, but other black and tan leaders did come out. I mean, and, and he did lose, and he was replaced as the, the GOP committeeman, as well as the state chairman during the 1896 campaign. Um, but still, Cooney was instrumental in pushing back against the burgeoning Lily White movement. Uh, he was a person who actually labeled them as the Lily Whites. Um, but after his death in 1897, there was an even stronger struggle among the Black and Tans over who would take his place as the head of the movement. Um, eventually, there were two major players in the Texas Republican Party, and they joined forces to push back against the, uh, the Lily Whites. Um, it was a businessman named Cecil A. Um, I'm sorry, um, it was a man named Edward H.R. Green, who was the son of a multimillionaire. And it was a, per, it was a man named uh, William M. McDonald. Uh, his name was Gooseneck Bill. So you had William McDonald and Edward Green. Uh, one was a multimillionaire, he had a railroad empire. Uh, Gooseneck Bill, was a black banker from Fort Worth. But this alliance wasn't able to stop the Lily White insurgents in the party. Um, after Green withdrew as state chairman in 1902, Cecil A. Lyon, who was a white businessman uh, from Sherman, he took control. And uh, he controlled the Texas state GOP until he died in, in 1915. But as the Texas State Historical Association notes here, quote, by 1904, Lyon was Theodore Roosevelt's agent in the state, as well as national committeeman and state chairman. Though black and tan delegations appeared in the 19, at the 1904 and the 1908 national conventions, they were pushed aside by Lyon's forces. Now to avoid criticism, one or two blacks were usually seated with lily white delegations to the national gatherings. So they did provide a little bit of cover for themselves, but the Lily White agenda was very much clear. And since they had control of the party, they were able to minimize the black and tans at the conventions that occurred in 1904 and 1908. Here's another quote. The Lily White Republicans appealed to racism to establish their party as a viable alternative for Southern Democrats. As a result, Blacks increasingly lost influence and power in the Republican Party. The Southern Democratic leadership greatly discouraged Black membership, and many Blacks felt that they had no political party in which to participate. So like I said, Black people ended up being in a position where they were politically homeless. Neither party really seemed to, to want them to be involved with what they were doing. Um, let me continue here. Now, the Historical Association also notes that that the Black and Tans, like I indicated earlier, they developed in different states differently throughout the South. So some started in, in the 1880s. Some didn't even show up until the 1920s. Um, now, in some states like Tennessee and Arkansas, uh, they didn't last very long. Um, but in areas like South Carolina and Mississippi, the Black and Tans lasted until 1960. Um, the, contentious, the contentiousness, according to the Texas State Histor Historical Association, the contentiousness between the two factions 
occasionally turn violent as evidence in 1888 by a race riot that broke out in Texas when white Republicans tried to wrest party control from blacks at that year's state convention. For African-Americans, this factional co conflict came to characterize the racial power struggle over who, who would lead the party, the multiracial coalition of black and tans or the conservative lily white faction. Um, this conflict became so intense that it split the Texas GOP in half. Um, now this happened while Theodore Roosevelt was battling with William Howard Taft for control of the Republican Party, the National Republican Party. Uh, the Lily Whites, they supported Roosevelt. They supported his bull moose campaign and they wanted to turn the Republican Party into a white opposition party to the Democrats. The Black and Tans sided with William Howard Taft and after the 1916 election, a man named Renfro B. Krieger ran for Texas governor and he and he actually didn't win the governorship, but he became the leader of the Texas GOP. So here's how it went under him. <laughs> the quote, the quote, though McDonald attempted a comeback in 1920 and proclaimed that color should predominate because 95% of all Texas Republican were Negroes. Okay, maybe they went up to 95% at that time. But to continue to, to continue the quote, 95% of all Texas Republicans were Negroes. The Lily Whites under Krieger retained firm control after the upheavals of 1912 and 1916. The Lily Whites reigned supreme under Republican presidents Warren G. Harding, Calvin Coolidge, and Herbert Hoover, despite the threats of blacks throughout the 1920s to bolt, to bolt the Republican fold for the Democratic Party, and despite efforts by Republican Congressman Harry McLeary Wurzbach to court the black and tans in his fight for ascendancy with Krieger. When black and tan, fa when black and tan factions appeared at the, at the 1920, 1924, and 1928 Republican National Conventions, they were shunted aside by Krieger and his followers. Lily White domination of the state GOP became academic through the 1930s as Texas blacks joined the black exodus into Democrat Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal coalition. So you can see how that went, right? They were fighting for, for their place in the Republican Party in Texas. But both people like Lyon and Krieger diminished their influence as much as possible. Um, and even though, like I, like I said at the beginning, there were plenty of people in the Republican Party who still wanted the Republican Party to maintain an important relationship with the Black community, there were more people who were fighting against it in the South. And while you might hear from the right that Black people just went to FDR because they wanted the free stuff, you can see from this passage that that wasn't true, right? I mean, what happened in reality is that a Republican party in the South that was dominated by the Lily White movement pushed black people into the waiting arms of the Democratic party. So the issue wasn't the fact that Democrats just became socialists, it's just that the Republican party didn't have anything to offer and was not interested in offering anything. So I'm just gonna kind of pause right there. Like I said, it only took about 10 to 15 years for the Lily White movement to materialize and begin the process of pushing black people out of the party. This, the, the, the black exodus to the Democratic Party did not start under FDR. It started under the, under the Lily White movement in the South. And you know, if you think, of, if you put yourself in that position, if you put yourself in the position that black Americans would have been in at that point, again, a lot of these people, probably most of these people were former slaves or at least the sons and daughters of former slaves, they knew that the Republican Party was all about black folks. And to see that change so fast, just so that they can appeal to white Southerners, that had to be heartbreaking. I would, I would imagine that a lot of these folks didn't even want to go to the Democratic Party. But where else were they gonna go? The Republicans were making it very clear that they didn't want anything to do with black people. Not all of them, again, like I said, there were people who were fighting against this, um, but they lost. Um, I'm gonna take a quick pause here. I'm gonna take a look at some of the chat, see if you guys has, have questions. Hopefully I'm not boring you. I know it's a lot of reading and a lot of quotes, but 
yeah. Uh, let's see what else. We, let me go back up here. Hey, you guys have a lot to say. Let's see. Okay, Aaron. So if you look in the show notes, you're going to see some books in there. I'm going to add some more stuff because I think there was a couple links that I that I didn't put in there. But uh, the link, the names of the books are in the show notes, and I'll also be mentioning which books I'm quoting from when I'm quoting. Um, don't let them Ralph Bunch you. You know what? I really wanted to talk about Ralph, Ralph Bunch, Ralph Bunch, in this presentation, but I just couldn't. I will be doing another video on him, and there's some other figures here here in in this history that I'm going to mention that I'm not really able to dig into but I will be talking about them as well. But Ralph Bunch was fascinating. And uh, the report that he made for the Republican Party, uh, I'm not going to spoil anything, but you probably, but I'm not going to tell you anything that you don't already know, because like I said, it's happening today. Um, let's see. Yep, they never talk about slavery up until 1964. Yep, you're right. Um, where did I read this? I'm not sure what you're referring to because I was kind of going through it here. But if you want to know, um, let me know the, the actual point that I made that you want to know where I read it, and then I'll and I'll tell you. Um, <clears throat> can someone get a list of the books? Uh, they're in the show notes, so just, just take a look there, and you'll and you'll see this, the books that I'm talking about. Um, I'm also going to also, like I said, I'm going to be mentioning them in the presentation as well. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. I think I've got enough here. Um, yeah. Great historical information. I'm from Texas and didn't know a lot of this. Yeah, I didn't either. Fascinating, right? Um, okay. So I'm going to go back here and in a second, we're going to start talking about FDR. Um, actually, we're going to start talking about him right now. So just set this up here. All right. Now, we've got FDR, who was also a virulent racist. This guy had a very close relationship with the N-word. <laughs> I, I discovered that when, in my reading. But again, imagine how bad you have to be that Black people will, will vote for a man named FDR, who is, and he who didn't hide his racism, by the way. He wasn't even really trying to reach out to Black voters with the New Deal, but you know who was? His wifey, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, was very good about reaching out to, to, to the black community and also to women as well because her husband was not interested. But in the lead up to Roosevelt's ascension to power, uh, black Americans were becoming increasingly disenchanted with the Republican Party for the reasons that I just listed off. Uh, the Republican presidents who came after Lincoln did very little to continue in the tradition of the party of Lincoln. Uh, to make matters worse, the, the Lily White movement in the South had driven a wedge between the party and its black supporters. Uh, President, Herber, President Herbert Hoover, uh, however, uh, despite doing very little to advance black causes, um, he received about two thirds to three fourths of the black vote in 1928. Now, in 1928, this would be the very last time that a Republican president won the majority of black votes. Think about that. In 1928, almost 100 years ago, this was the last time that a Republican president won the majority of black votes. I'm going to quote from a book called The Loneliness of the Black Republican. This was written by Dr. Leah Wright Rigur. I'm going to be quoting extensively from this book throughout this presentation, and it is in the show notes. I would highly recommend buying this book. You can get it on Kindle. You can get it on Amazon. You can get the hard copy or you can get it on your Kindle. I have it on my on, on the Kindle app. Very enlightening book. Very, very enlightening. Very dense. I haven't even quite finished the book yet. 
And, and the reason why is because I tend to read fast, but you can't read this book fast because she has so much information in there. And it is so, again, it's so dense that you have to actually read certain paragraphs two or three times to really grasp what she's talking about. She has tons of different quotes from newspapers, from politicians and things like that. It, it, you need to read this book if you're interested in this topic. So again, I'm going to be quoting from her extensively and I'm going to be letting you know uh, when it's coming from her book. But here's a quote. A growing number of African-Americans argued that since the demise of Reconstruction, Republican presidents had failed, as historian Nancy Weiss describes, to measure up to the legacy of Lincoln. As if the despair and suffering ushered in by the Depression was not enough to question the economic conservatism of Herbert Hoover, the president also displayed a record of disregard and disrespect toward African-Americans in his attempt to cultivate lily-white republicanism within the South. So the lily-white movement didn't end um, under, you know, and when FDR came to power, they continued. It had continued under his predecessor, uh, Herbert Hoover. Um, now, uh, Rigord continues, quote, black leaders debated whether Hoover and the party's decisions came out of complacency, indifference, or a more insidious racism, but the result was clear. Republican leaders neglected both the economic and civil rights needs of black citizens. The progress of African Americans was as stagnant as the economy, with few victories in the struggle against segregation, discrimination, racial violence, and disenfranchisement. So the Republican Party's refusal to address the needs of Black Americans created an opportunity for the Democrats under a Roosevelt administration that at least paid some lip service to being concerned about the plight of former slaves and their descendants. Now, keep in mind, the New Deal wasn't really intended for Black people. And in the beginning years of it, Black people weren't really able to access the benefits. Not all of them, anyway. I think they were able to access some, but in general, no, no, not really. Um, and if it weren't for the Lily White uh, movement in the Republican Party, this wouldn't have been good enough for Black people. Now, eventually, they were able to access more of those benefits, but at first, they were not. Um, quote from Dr. Leah Wright Rigur, thus, while the realignment of the Black electorate between 1932 and 1936 was, was remarkable, it was not a surprise. Many African Americans were ripe for the courting from a shrewd Democratic presidential incumbent. They also had nothing to lose by leaving the Republican Party, whereas political coalitions with Northern Democrats hinted at the possibility of racial and economic progress. So again, they had nothing to lose by leaving the Republican Party. The Democrat Party basically said what Trump said in 2016, what the hell do you have to lose? Black people said nothing because Republicans aren't interested. Uh, she continues, quote, moreover, the Roosevelt administration was the first administration since Lincoln's to actively minister to the needs of blacks, though many of the programs were not deliberately targeted at African Americans. So the bottom line is that despite the fact that most of FDR's New Deal programs were not intended for black Americans, it still benefited them. Um, on the other hand, the Republican Party failed to offer a viable alternative to African Americans, which, again, is why they had nothing to lose by going with Roosevelt. Now, to sweeten the deal, Roosevelt appointed a black cabinet. Now, this black cabinet was staffed with um, African American advisors who, uh, quote, consulted with various administration agency and program directors. So Roosevelt even makes things better by doing a little bit of pandering. He formed his own uh, black cabinet. And here's the thing, you know, we might say this is pandering, but this was a serious thing. These people actually did have input as to what went on. Um, now, while this was going on, African-Americans started seeing that their fortunes were increasing um, and a higher percentage of black people felt comfortable supporting Roosevelt. He, in 1936, get this, in 1936, Franklin Delano Roosevelt earned about 70% of the black vote. I'm going to say that again. In 1936, President Roosevelt earned about 70% of the black vote. This was a huge increase from the 1932 election. 
there are there aren't even numbers for that, but it does say that he just won a handful of black votes. So that could have been 10, 20 percent or so, maybe even less. And then he increased that to 70 percent, not because his policies were so great. Mind you, this is how I look at this. It's not because FDR was so great. It's because the Republican Party wasn't interested. They had they had it's not that they didn't have anything to offer. They just didn't want to offer it to black people. So they didn't bother to compete. Is this sounding familiar, y'all? The Democrats reached out. They paid lip service. They even crafted some policies that would benefit black people and the Republican Party was silent. Um, but like I said, this doesn't mean that African-Americans were entirely sold on the Democratic Party. Now, despite what a lot of us hear from uh, right-leaning commentators, um, who again, I'm I'm not this isn't to throw shade. I, a lot of them just don't know. This is just what they've been hearing too. A lot of them are ignorant, which what do we know about the word ignorant? What do I always say about ignorant? It just all it means is that you don't know what you don't know. It doesn't mean you're a bad person, it doesn't mean you're stupid, it just means that you don't know everything, just like I don't know everything. So, but despite what a lot of them say, the eventual black exodus to the Democratic Party did not occur under Roosevelt. After supporting his second term they weren't quite on the Democrat bandwagon as they had been before. Uh, Dr. Ragur writes that the black electorate, they were substantially divided over the next three decades. And like I said, the New Deal, despite its promises, it did very little for black Americans in terms of civil rights. Uh, the programs and agencies of the New Deal, they were rife with, with, with discrimination. Um, and at this point, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party of this era, they didn't display clear-cut differences in their civil rights policies. Um, the result, I mean, was a surge in Democratic support among the Black electorate, but, quote, not the total liquidation of Republican backing. So the Republican Party didn't quite lose the Black vote just yet. They lost a huge, substantial amount of it. But there was still hope at this point. I mean, the Republicans could have turned tail. They could have, they could have walked back what they were doing before. They they could have gone back to being the party of Lincoln, and most likely they would have earned the black vote back. Maybe not 80, 70, 90 percent, but closer to 50 percent. Um now <clears throat> again, like I was saying, black people didn't just end up leaving the Republic, Republican Party just to go with the Democrats. As time went on, they embraced independence. They were forcing both parties to compete for their votes. I'm gonna say that one more time. I'm gonna let it sink in. During this period, <laughs> they embraced independence and they fo forced both parties to compete for their votes. <sighs> that is just warms my heart to hear that because that's what I wanna happen today, damn it. <laughs> but I digress. Um, so Dr. Rigour, she quotes from a 1936 article uh, from the New York Amsterdam News. And this article said, quote, independent voting will guarantee voters recognition. Candidates will be compelled satisfactorily to solicit their votes and the voters will hold the key to elections instead of the party figureheads as it has been in the past. It means that split ticket voting will be a feature of future elections. Now, Here's the thing, during this time period, during you know the mid to late 30s, the Republican Party was still straddling the fence. Like I said, even though the Lily White movement was a thing, there were always people in the GOP who were pushing back against the direction that the Lily Whites wanted to take the party. So this resulted in a situation where the Republican Party was firmly planted on the political fence. It was refraining from overtly appealing to black voters and it was refraining, refraining from overtly appealing to white Southerners. So, I mean, that does t tell me that there's a little bit of progress that's being made here because before the, the Republicans seemed to be all about white Southerners. And by the way, I'm going to mention this. Despite the Lily White movement, when it was in its heyday um, in Texas and in other areas of the, of the South, they put in all that effort to, to not be labeled as the party of the Negro, and they still lost the South. The Democrats still control the South because remember they're going to control it for about seventy-five years after uh, the Civil War. 
So they still lost out. But again, there was a, this tug of war between the two factions, whether they referred to themselves as, as lily whites or black and tans or not, there were still these two factions that were vying for the control of the party. Um, <clears throat> so Dr. Rigur writes, uh, quote, for the next three decades, the Republican Party attempted a balancing act between appealing to black voters and ignoring them, depending on whether these efforts would alienate white voters. They desperately did not want to alienate white voters in the South. Um, but this wasn't just the Republicans doing this. It wasn't just an issue for the GOP. The Democrats were doing the same exact thing. She writes, uh, Dr. Rigur writes, quote, but the 1936 campaign also highlighted tensions within the, within the Democratic Party, namely between the Southern and Northern wings of the party. Though it had attempted to swallow black outreach as political expediency, the segregationist faction struggled with the National Party's decision to court black voters. What you're gonna see here is that both parties had a Southern segregationist problem. This wasn't necessarily an issue between the Republicans and the Democrats. This was an issue between the North and the South in both parties. So both parties struggled with not wanting to piss off the segregationists in the South while still being able to court black voters to a certain extent. The difference is that the Democrats made up their mind quicker than the Republicans did. Huge surprise, right? Um, but each party like I said, had to deal with the Southern factions of their, their, their party. Um, one point of contention in the Democratic Party was the fact that President Roosevelt did not seem as concerned about black issues as he had previously. Now this became obvious uh, when the debate over anti-lynching anti legislation came up in 1938. Southern lawmakers, they engaged in a six week long filibuster to oppose anti-lynching legislation. Now, back then, obviously anti-lynching legislation was important because this is when the Ku Klux Klan was around and they were lynching both white and black Republicans and anybody who you know supported black people. Um, in black media back then, and yes, black media, there was black media even as far back as, as the thirties, really even before that, even you know, during slavery, but they were savaging the Democrats because it kept failing to push the bill through because of these Southern lawmakers who wanted to hold it up. So Dr. Rigur writes, quote, dismayed by the president's apparent indifference to the need of black, to the needs of black constituents, black newspapers railed against Roosevelt. In one article, the Chicago Defender argued that a word from the chief executive would have guaranteed the anti-lynching bill's passage. African Americans widely interpreted the president's silence on the matter as opposition to the measure, which was offensive to the South. Roosevelt would never pass, let alone enforce, an anti-lynching provision, uh, reason Time Magazine, for if he did, all the money in the federal treasury could not hold the already troubled South in line for him. Wow. So, FDR, you know, he extended a hand and he ended up going back on that later. Again, huge surprise, right? After they, they've already got the vote or at least most of it. I mean, he got 70%. Why would he do anything? He's not going to pass anti-lynching legislation, right? Even so, he still got the support. Um, <clears throat> so naturally, this infighting and the reticence over fighting for Black Americans presented a significant opportunity for Republicans to win back black votes. Black Republicans sharply criticized Roosevelt's lack of concern for black Americans. They even went after Republicans who they believed were anti-black. But as we know, the Republican party never misses an opportunity to miss an opportunity, right? Nothing new, there's nothing new under the sun. So at this point, we're going to talk about Harry Truman. Obviously after you know FDR died in his fourth term, Harry Truman took over. And this is where I, or what I mentioned before is that at a certain point, the Democrats made up their mind 
before the Republicans did. And this happened under President Truman. This guy right here, look at him. <laughs> um, by the time we get to Harry Truman, uh, the Republican Party has all but ma made their decision regarding which group of voters it would court. Despite many warnings from black Republicans and an independent report compiled by Ralph S. Bunch, who the GOP had hired as a consultant, the party still decided to focus on white voters in the South. So the Democrats made their decision to start focusing on black people. And after that, under Truman, they decide to ignore the warnings of Ralph S. Bunch. Now, I'm going to say just a little bit about Bunch. They hired him to compile a report on what rent went wrong as far as the Republicans uh, getting the black vote. Now, Bunch was not partisan. So they wanted him to look into this and give an, an, an objective account, which he did. And this is something that I wish I could have dug into, and I will, but very important. Because I'll tell you right now, a lot of this, he could have written that report today. Essentially, he said that the Republicans weren't bothering to reach out to black voters. They weren't speaking to their needs. They weren't listening to them. Same stuff that they're doing now. But um, from the loneliness of the black Republican, quote, the GOP's multiplicity did not last for within the decade, as Bunch rightly warned, the continued pursuit of both the lily white vote and the black vote alienated the majority of the black electorate, a division exacerbated by the, by the civil rights activism of the presidential administration of Harry S. Truman. So now the Democrats are all in on civil rights. Now, this doesn't mean that they're not still dealing with the segregationist faction in the South. They're still dealing with that. But the crowd, the faction that wanted to, uh, to help the black community, they were winning out but it was the opposite on the Republican side. Truman, uh, he created the President's Commission on Civil Rights in 1946, which published a report detailing the shocking treatment of African-Americans all across the country. The report, the report was titled uh, To Secure These Rights. It listed a series of atrocities that black Americans faced, including lynchings, segregation, poverty, racial violence, discrimination, and other issues. Um, in response to this report, Truman gave a speech in 1948 in which he explained the need for civil rights legislation and other measures to, pr to promote equality for African Americans. He called for a 10-point program designed to protect the rights of all citizens. Now, needless to say, this greatly increased his popularity among black voters while angering Southern Democrats. He also issued an executive order to desegregate the armed forces. Now, in the 1940 election, Truman won 75% of the black vote. 75%. Meanwhile, the Republican Party was still struggling with its approach to black voters. Like I said, there was still that, there's still that faction in the GOP that was pushing the party to go back to the being the party of Lincoln. Many in the GOP recognized the many in the GOP recognized that the, their problem was with their failure to engage in productive outreach to the black community. Um, Dr. Rigur, she writes, quote, for the Republican Party, the election of 1948 was problematic in various ways, but especially in that party strategist determined that had 15% more African Americans voted for the GOP, Thomas Dewey would have been president. Um, some black Republican leaders, they identified the, the GOP's weakness when it came to winning over black voters. Here's another quote from Loneliness of the Black Republican. Quote, those few black Republican leaders that emerged from the shadows of the election accused the party of everything from mismanagement and negativism to lethargy and apathy and its failure to woo African-American voters. The GOP, black Republicans further argued, had relied on a stale strategy of attacking the programs of the New Deal and criticizing the Democratic Party's civil rights failures to entice the black electorate. Instead, much like Bunch had done it nearly a dec decade earlier, Afri African American party members maintained that the GOP should have offered new and constructive solutions to address the economic and social problems of African-Americans. 
But perhaps the most serious of the charges levied, levied was that of the burgeoning unholy alliance between Republicans and Southern Democrats in Congress. Now, I'm going to bring out another point in this passage here. Black Republicans were telling the party that one of the mistakes they made was focusing on criticizing the Democrats more than selling the benefits of the Republican Party. Does that sound familiar? There is nothing new under the sun. The Republican Party is making the same mistakes now that it made back in the 30s. But after all of this, after FDR and Truman, we have the Eisenhower administration. There he is, Dwight Eisenhower. Now, this was very interesting because civil rights was still a huge issue at this point, right? Uh, there were people who, I mean, on both sides who really wanted to push for civil rights for black Americans. Um, after Eisenhower became president, the, the nature of this situation kind of uh, changed a little bit. So when President Dwight Eisenhower, he won the 1952 election, right? And he got only 21% of the black vote. Uh, this was less than what Dewey had won in 1948. Uh, but to make matters worse, black party affiliation in the GOP dropped to 18%. So only 18% of African Americans identified as Republican. This was a seven point decrease that occurred over four years. Um, now the GOP continued to do okay among middle-class African Americans, but it didn't have a whole lot of success with the poor and working class black Americans, uh, same as today. But Eisenhower managed to win all but nine states without significant black support. Um, now, this seemed to bolster the arguments of those in the Republican Party who wanted to abandon black voters in favor of Southern whites. Um, but the thing about Eisenhower's appeal is that he was able to successfully find a balance between endorsing programs in the New Deal but also supporting states' rights. So he was he was more of a moderate. Um, now, here's the thing about Eisenhower, though. When it came to civil rights, he wasn't against civil rights for black people, but he wasn't actually gung, he wasn't exactly gung-ho about it either. He was more of a gradualist. He embraced gradualism when it came to black people being considered as more than second-class citizens. Now, this was likely because, again, he didn't want to alienate white voters in the South. So Dr. Regur writes, quote, racial issues, Eisenhower argued, were matters best resolved through a policy of gradualism. He encouraged African-Americans to be patient and place their ultimate faith in time, a position that most blacks rejected, of course. So this naturally made a lot of black people skeptical about Eisenhower. Now, here's the thing, though. Black people didn't hate Eisenhower. They, they didn't despise him. But they didn't feel like he was going to get their agenda done as fast as the, as the Democrats were, which is why he only got 21% of the vote. But even after he won, most black people were willing to give him a chance. Even though he was promoting gradualism, um, he was still a clear departure from the lily white politics of Southern Republicans and Herbert Hoover. Uh, when he was campaigning, he met with, he met with the NAACP and um, he was promising to advance civil rights causes through legislation. Um, but his, he opposed the fair employment practices community. This was established under uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And so combined with his support of gradualism, Again, it made black people skeptical. Um, they weren't sure whether he was gonna push for civil rights or not. But there was one thing, there was one thing that the Eisenhower administration did that was kind of a saving grace, that kind of had black people hoping, gave black people hope that Eisenhower was gonna come through at least in some way for them. And this, this saving grace, what Eisenhower did is he appointed this guy. This is Eisenhower and a man named E. Frederick Morrow. 
Now, E. Frederick Morrow, Eisenhower appointed him as White House Officer for Special Projects. He did this in 1955, so about three years after he was elected. E. Frederick Morrow was the first Black American to hold an executive position at the White House. So this was a historic appointment. Now, Black media was celebrating this, and the Black community loved that Eisenhower did this. Um, Ebony Magazine, they celebrated the appointment. They called Morrow a triple threat in the administration. And what they meant by that was that Morrow was a White House official, presidential advisor on race, and a quote unquote Negro spokesman. But E. Frederick Morrow actually wrote a book and he also had a diary. I want to read both of those. But when you read his writings, you can see that this was a conflicted person. Morrow was conflicted between his duties as a White House executive and as a black man who wanted the best for the black community and had to figure out how to navigate within the Eisenhower administration and the Republican Party at large. Um, I'm going to read a, a, an excerpt from his diary here. And there's a quote from, from him. And he says, quote, I am an appointee with loyalty to the administration, the party, and the president. But I am also a Negro who feels very keenly the ills that afflict my race and its efforts to secure all the privileges and responsibilities of citizenship that have been denied for three centuries. It is my responsibility to explain to white people how Negroes feel on this matter, and by the same token, explain to Negroes the administration's attitude. Imagine being in that position. That could not have been easy. I can't even imagine what he had to go through, especially dealing with the racists who would have been in the Republican Party, um, and, and also dealing with the non-racists that were in his party while also speaking to black people about the Eisenhower administration. This man got a lot of, e oh, not email. <laughs> this man got a lot of mail criticizing the administration and he had to always try to smooth things over, but he wasn't afraid to, uh, to call it out to call out BS on the right when he needed to. You know, I, you know, doing what I do, it's stressful for me to be one who actually criticizes the Republican Party. I, I don't really talk about this, but um, it's not always easy for me. Like when I send out certain tweets, I think about them first. I'm like, oh, what's going to happen if I tweet this? But I have to say what, what's on my mind. I have to say what I see. And he was the same way, but the pressure for him would have been, a thousand times worse than anything that I feel because I'm not in the president's ear. Um, I'm not in the Republican party's ear. And he, he had to really figure out how to play the game. And, you know, he did accomplish some things. So let me go on here. Despite his concerns, Morrow was instrumental in persuading Eisenhower, along with other members of his administration, to take black outreach seriously, but it wasn't easy. After seeing the administration's and the Republican Party's silence on the murder of Emmett Till and its hesitance to do something about Southern Democrats' treatment of black Americans, he wrote that he could not understand leaving black Southerners to the, quote, mercy of state governments that have manifested their intention to violate all laws human and divine. He was angry. I mean, I couldn't even imagine being in that position, like serving in the White House and Emmett Till gets killed and you're like, Eisenhower, you need to say something about this. The Republican Party, you need to say something about this. We need to do something about this. And having them push back or just slow walk it or just not do it at all. I mean, there was one... Uh, confrontation that Morrow had when he, he had a confrontation with Secretary of the Cabinet, uh, Max Rabb. Now, this Max Rabb guy, he, oh, I'm just going to read the quote, okay? He was complaining that, quote, Negroes had not demonstrated any kind of gratitude for Eisenhower's civil rights policies. Max Rabb was arguing that it alienated most of the responsible officials in the White House. He claimed that black folks were, quote, too aggressive in their demands, unquote, and said that their, quote, ugliness and surliness and manner was beginning to show. 
he claimed that the demands of the black community exceeded any reasonable concessions. When I first read that, my blood was boiling. Again, I can't imagine what Marl must have been feeling at this moment. Like, how do you not want to, you, you know, just slap the guy in the face? Like, this isn't enough. Gradualism doesn't work. Um, in reflecting on his confrontation with Rab, Marl wrote, quote, it is difficult to make any white person understand that you cannot tell intelligent, loyal, battle-tested young Negro Americans to accept gradualism. He continued, quote, each Negro today wants first-class citizenship in his own time and is not appeased by the observation that some future generation will benefit by his sacrifices. Now, given these realities, I mean, it might it would be reasonable to assume that E. Frederick Morrow did not succeed. He failed. But the truth is that he didn't let these obstacles cow him into submission. Instead, he pushed harder. He doubled down. Uh, his efforts to push the GOP to make an authentic outreach to the Black community were largely successful in the 1956 campaign. Because of Morrow, Eisenhower selected Helen Edmonds, who was a Black history professor, to deliver his second his seconding speech at the Republican National Convention. Now, uh, E. Frederick Morrow, along with Val Washington, a, a person named Val Washington, who was the head of the Negro division of the Republican National Committee, they traveled together across the country campaigning for Eisenhower. Um, now, Dr. Rigur gives us the results of these efforts. She writes, quote, despite internal Republican sabotage, Morrow witnessed a groundswell of black support for Eisenhower in Tennessee, North Carolina, New York, and New Jersey. In November 1956, the enthused White House aide cheered that a great many Negroes are eager to be convinced that Eisenhower is the man they should support. His persistence was worth the effort for, as Morrow described, thousands of Negroes across the country broke their ties to the Democratic Party and offered Republicans 39% of their vote in 1956, helping the president claim re-election. He helped Eisenhower almost, dub almost double his black support just by trying, just by talking to black people, just by going to black community. Eisenhower himself didn't even need to do it. I'm, I'm sure he did some of that traveling too, but mostly it was Morrow acting as his surrogate, acting as his liaison between the Eisenhower administration and the black community. And he, again, almost doubled his black support. But here's the thing, it wasn't just Eisenhower's support that increased. The Republican Party saw a 6% increase in black voters registering as Republican. So Morrow accomplished a huge feat here. And he was one of the most important reasons why Eisenhower nearly doubled his black support. Um, one of the things that helped with this though was the fact that the Democratic Party still had, hadn't quite dealt with the problems presented by its segregationist faction, but still, that's a huge accomplishment. Morrow capitalized on what the Democratic Party was going through. Now, even after Eisenhower's victory, Morrow still continued to have his issues with the administration, uh, which I'm not going to get into in this presentation, but it will be something I talk about um, later. I mean, E. Frederick Morrow is a fascinating figure in the history of the Republican Party and in Black history. So it just kind of, it goes to show that even back then, even though the, Repub the Republican Party had made horrible, horrible mistakes, he was able to still help close that gap just by reaching out, just by talking to people. He convinced black people to vote for Eisenhower, even though Eisenhower was a gradualist. So I'm gonna check out the chats here before we move on to Barry Goldwater and Richard Nixon. Hopefully you're still with me. <laughs> Let's see what we got here. All right. Well, you guys had a lot to say. You guys are having quite the conversation here. Um. <laughs> hmm. Okay. So was there a big switch of the parties that Democrats usually refer to? Yes and no. It was more of a realignment than an actual switch. You know, I know a lot of, you know, a lot of Democrats have tried to tell me that all of the racists 
and the Democratic Party got up one day and decided they wanted to be Republicans, and all the non-racists in the Republican parties got up and all of a sudden wanted to become Democrat. It's not quite how it worked. It's a lot more nuanced than that. But did the South switch to the Republican Party? Yeah, we know that it did, and there's a reason why. Some of you aren't going to like it, but I, you know, I'm going to say it. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, yeah, so that that's a good, decent answer to the question. It wasn't a switch as we understand. It was an expungement of blacks from the GOP. Yep. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Okay. Wendy, seems to me at that time it became less about which party held what values and more about what a person looked like. It's pretty damn shallow. Yeah, you're right. It was. Um, let's see what else we've got here. Oh, that's interesting. This coincided with the push of trade labor unions which removed most blacks from what was once dominated by blacks in the South. That's an interesting point too. Um, what else do we got here? <clears throat> okay, it keeps cutting out, Jeff, can't follow the content. You know, that might be an issue with Periscope. Um, if you wanna go to YouTube, uh, go to a fresh perspective, with Jeff Charles on YouTube, that should work better because sometimes Periscope has some issues. Um, let's see. What else we got here? Okay. Is there a book on Morrow? I'd love to read it. I'll put that in the show notes, but um, uh, what, what was that book called? I think it was called Black and in the White House or something like that. But if you look up E. Frederick Morrow and type in White House in Google, it'll come up. Um, yeah, but he, he actually wrote a book on his experience in the White House. All right. So you guys ready to talk about Barry Goldwater and um, Richard Nixon? Because that's going to be fun. Let me get a little sippy sip. Before I go into that, I'm just going to remind you, please share this video. Really appreciate it. If you haven't subscribed already, hit that subscribe button. Um, you know, and if you want to support my work, the links are below and up here. And you can do super chats as well. So if you want to guarantee that I'll answer your question or respond to something you say, hit that super chat. Helps me out a lot. Okay. Let me get myself situated here so we can go on to the next part. And uh, just going to warn you, you might get a little mad at this because if you think that the, the tomfoolery was bad enough already, it's about to get worse. <laughs> okay. So um, you guys asked about, you know, the, the party switch. So we're going to go into that. Um, the Southern strategy or what I actually like to refer to as the long Southern strategy, which is actually the title of one of the books that I, that, that I used to uh, make this presentation. And like I said, I mean, the real Southern strategy began, began with the Lily White movement, but the Southern strategy began in earnest under Sen Senator Barry Goldwater, who represented Arizona. And Barry Goldwater, Barry Goldwater in, the 64 election, he essentially drove the dagger into the heart of the Republican Party's black outreach efforts. It was already on live support. It was, there was They were already going back and forth with different factions saying, yes, we need to reach out to black people, and the other faction saying, no, let's just focus on white Southerners. But it is important to understand the attitudes and the prevailing beliefs that led to Goldwater's widespread support in the GOP. Um, after Roosevelt and Truman finally decided, decided to take that plunge and start embracing the black community and black voters, and after they decided to pass critical civil rights legislation, the, the Dixiecrats, they found themselves to be politically homeless. They, that, that's when that, the Dixiecrat movement kind of formed during that, that period. 
but they were being marginalized in the Democratic Party, and the Republicans hadn't hadn't yet fully accepted them. Uh, again, while Eisenhower was a gradualist, he was not he was not supportive of protecting people who were trying to ensure that African Americans never attained a full first class citizenship. <clears throat> oh, there's Barry right there. So now, oh wait, let me go back. Yeah, so yeah, with Eisenhower. So he was a gradualist, but again, he didn't want to protect people who wanted to violate the rights of African Americans. Um, this was evidenced by his decision to use the National Guard to force desegregation in schools. Um, now, what I'm going to be quoting from right now is the book Black, uh, Republicans and the Black Vote, written by Michael K. Fontroy. I quoted that earlier, but I'm going to go back to that book right now. So Fontroy noted that, quote, Goldwater made a name for himself among racial conservatives in the South with his opposition to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, he was one of eight non-Southerners in the Senate to vote against the act. Um, and it was also his general position on civil rights issues. Now, to be fair, uh, Goldwater had voted for every single civil rights bill, civil rights bill before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He changed his tune in that year when he was campaigning. So um, Fontenoy continues, quote, he campaigned in stark racial terms, particularly in the South. His Texas campaign tried to exploit white racial economic fears with a poster that targeted employees and employers. The poster, the poster had images of an unsmiling white man with the word fired, placed below his face, and a smiling black man with the word hired placed, bl placed below his face. The language was stark. And I'm going to show you something. This was that poster. So I'm going to read what it says to you because it's probably going to be hard to read with the thing, but um, here we go. So the poster read, employees, read this. Did you know that Lyndon Johnson's civil rights bill can get you fired from your job and give it to a person of another race? No matter what ability you have to do your job or how much seniority you have on your job, you can lose your job because Johnson's civil rights bill. This is your last chance. Vote to put an end to racial favoritism. Vote to protect your job, your family, your home. Employers, read this. This is your last chance to save your freedom to run your own business as you choose. Well, imagine being those people. <laughs> so here's the thing. I mean, here, here's what that ad was basically saying. His ad was telling white workers that the civil rights bill would strip them of their livelihood while handing it over to a black worker. And it was telling white business owners that they would no longer be allowed to discriminate based on race. Goldwater used this Southern resentment to gather support in the GOP for his presidential bid. The strategy was called Operation Dixie. Now here I'm gonna quote from a book called The Long Southern Strategy by Angie Maxwell and Todd Shields. And in their book, they note that, quote, despite a fairly progressive record on black equality, Goldwater voted against the Civil Rights Act because he did not believe federal enforcement was possible and state and local enforcement was preferable. He insisted that the more the federal government has attempted to legislate morality, the more it actually has incited hatred and violence. So that was Goldwater's argument. Now the authors continued, quote, Goldwater's campaign strategist convinced the candidate to highlight that vote and that sentiment in his final swing through the South called Operation Dixie. With Thurman, Strom Thurman as his champion, Goldwater received a warm welcome in states like Alabama, where he was actually endorsed by the Grand Dragon of the state chapter of the Ku Klux Klan. Come election day, Gold, Goldwater managed to flip five deep South states red. Now remember, the Democrats had those states on lock, but this is where their control over the, over the South begins to fade. Now to make matters worse, Goldwater bluntly argued that the Republican party should stop reaching out to black voters and quote, go hunting where the ducks are. 
This quote is from Dr. Leah Wright Rigur, Loneliness of the Black Republican. She writes, the problem, as the Wall Street Journal explained, was that the senator employed both rhetoric and strategy that placed black citizens on the fringes of the American political system. Goldwater also appeared to have no interest in wooing black voters, reasoning that the party would gain little by pursuing black voters, suggesting that they as a bloc were irreversibly lost to the Democratic Party. Although not the first Republican to make this argument, the senator was among the first to do so in such a public and aggressive fashion. As he expounded during a March 1961 meeting, the party should, quote, quit trying to win Negro votes, unquote. Since the African-American electorate had no sense of loyalty or gratitude, quote, party leaders should face up to the fact that although Republicans have done more for the Negro, Goldwater complained, Democrats are getting more and more of their votes. A speech to Atlanta residents delivered later that same year was blunter. We're not going to get the Negro vote as a block in 1964, so we ought to go hunting where the ducks are. That is how Goldwater killed black outreach in the GOP. He had a huge following. His following was so powerful and so pervasive and so loyal that even though he was soundly defeated in the 1964 election, his campaign still represented a significant turning point in Republican Party, in, the, in Republican politics, I'm sorry. His performance in the South was noteworthy. I'm going back to the long Southern strategy again. That's where this quote is from. Quote, Goldwater's greatest margins of victory came from counties with the highest population of African-American residents, where any change to the racial pecking order proved the most alarming. In Mississippi alone, Goldwater received 87% of the vote. 87% of the vote in Mississippi. So when you had areas that had a high black population, the whites in those areas wanted to support Goldwater because they knew he was going to oppose civil rights legislation. But again, Goldwater lost, but his uh, his spirit still remained in the party. His faction still remained. Um, now, Lyndon B. Johnson won, obviously, and this led to the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which outlawed discriminatory practices in regard to voting. It uh, prevented states from using literacy tests and other such methods um, that were used in the South to, pre to prevent African Americans from voting. And of course, this intensified resentment among Southern whites. From the long Southern strategy, quote, that is how powerful that angst was and how deep its roots stretched. Though several generations removed, the memory of the Confederate disenfranchisement during post-war military occupation and the resulting election of hundreds of former slaves and freedmen to local, state, and even national office made the threat to white power anything but abstract. So white Southerners were feeling threatened, right? They were feeling like they were losing their hold on power. They felt like their place in America was being redefined. And largely, that was true because Black people were, were coming up and they were gaining more power. Um, now, as I said before, contrary to, contrary to what many believed at the time, Goldwater's loss did not lessen the influence of the faction that he had created. Uh, its influence remained and it even grew after the 1964 election. Uh, despite the fact that many within the Republican Party pushed back. Now, there's a lot of detail here that I had to leave out, but I will be talking about the struggle over this, the struggle between the Goldwater faction, which might as well have been the Lily White movement, and those who opposed it, especially after the election. There were a lot of people that were pushing uh, to get the party to go back to being the party of Lincoln. And it's a fascinating battle during the 60s and into the early 70s. 70s. It is, there's so much, there's so much, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There, there's just so much detail that really fleshes this out and just shows how fiercely this battle was fought in the GOP. But unfortunately, Goldwater's wing of the party wielded influence over the next Republican president, which was Richard Milhouse Nixon. <clears throat> now, oh, else isn't working. 
Now, President Nixon, he was a mixed bag when it came to the black community. Now, of course, everybody on the left is going to tell you that he was a racist, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he didn't do anything for black people, yada, yada, yada. The truth is a lot more nuanced. So don't listen to leftists. <laughs> I mean, now, now, to be fair, there are some leftist publications that are a little bit more fair to Nixon. Um, I mean, just like LBJ, Nixon had his racism issues, right? Everybody else did back then, too. Doesn't excuse it, but it gives it perspective. Um, he became a proponent of affirmative action, and he promoted the idea of black capitalism instead of emphasizing government welfare programs to foster economic growth for black Americans. So Dr. Rigur writes from Loneliness of the Black Republican, she writes, quote, expounding on these ideas in a lengthy Jet questionnaire, Jet Magazine, Nixon wrote, quote, I am the only candidate who truly believes that black people on their own steam and with remedial help from the government are going to make it. He also said that African-Americans like, uh, like Edmund Brooke, uh, Edmund Brooke was the first black senator who was actually elected to his position, I believe in Massachusetts. Um, and he was a Republican. He said that people like Ed Brooke were symptomatic of what I hope will be an increasing political phenomenon in this country. The realization by black people and their leaders that their best hope lies not in the democratic plantation politics of the past, but in the kinds of programs as I have put forward. And here you see the beginning of the plantation talk. <laughs> um, now, to be fair, the, the plantation analogy had been used before this, but this was a, the first example of a major Republican leader using the term. Now, I will say that he likely didn't necessarily mean it the way people have used it today, but that's where that term first starts to, to gain prominence. Um, now, Nixon, he actually publicly rejected the Goldwater era notion that the Republican Party should ignore black voters. He had an interview with Ebony Magazine and he expressed his regret that he didn't try harder to earn black votes in his 1960 campaign. Uh, quote, he says, in, 19, in a 1962 interview with Ebony Magazine, Richard Nixon grimly confessed, I could have become president. I needed only 5% more votes in the Negro areas. I could have gotten them if I had campaigned harder. So he's acknowledging that he messed up, essentially, and that he should have taking the black vote more seriously. Now, he did try. It's not that he didn't try at all, but he acknowledges that he didn't try as hard. But he also pushed back against a lot of what Goldwater said. So again, from loneliness of the black Republican, Dr. Rigura says that he interviewed with Ebony for two hours. And he talked about the ways that the future of the Republican Party dovetailed with the future of African Americans. So Nixon says, we can't say to Negroes, come to us. We've got to go after them. We've got to change the image of the GOP among Negroes. The Democrats are well organized and well financed, but we've got to get into the Negro areas if we expect to mold a party for all people. We've got to convince Negroes that they're better off economically under a GOP president. And then he criticized Goldwater's approach to the black community. He said that it would be a mistake for the GOP to, quote, accept the beliefs of Barry Goldwater and write off the Negro vote. If Goldwater wins, if Goldwater wins his fight, our party would eventually become the first major all-white political party, and that isn't good. That would be a violation of GOP principles. Uh, well, we know how that worked out. Um, <laughs> Now, Nixon wasn't the only one who felt this way. Uh, there was a national committee that the Republican Party formed on big cities. And this committee, this task force, came to the same conclusion. They said, quote, the findings of the national committee's special task force on big cities found evidence to support claims like those of Nixon's. Um, in March of 1961, the 14-member subcommittee issued a preliminary six-page memo that attributed the politician's defeat in 1960 to the GOP's failure to identify aggressively with the, quote, interests of African Americans. Um, now, there were a lot of black 
uh, black Americans who were skeptical of Nixon, just like they were skeptical of Eisenhower. Um, the Call and Post, which is a major black publication, they published a piece and they were kind of different because there were also black people who were optimistic about, about Nixon. And so the Call and Post published a piece that said, quote, Nixon will do more for African-Americans than has been accomplished in the last hundred years. Sound economic gains and, res and restoration of pride and dignity are in store for minority groups. Um, now, among those who were skeptical, they didn't believe that, they didn't necessarily believe that Nixon didn't want to do these things, but they just didn't think he'd be able to pull it off. And probably for good reason. Uh, Dr. Ragura writes, even as prominent white politicians echoed black Republicans' ideas, blacks themselves were divided about those same politicians. Quote, I agree with Richard Nixon's ideas of black capitalism, but I cannot support his candidacy, Harlem resident James Green stated. Quote, he will have too many debts to pay for the conservative reactionary Southerners that won the nomination for him. There is um, some truth to this, but somebody else also chimed in, a very revered black Republican figure. Um, now this guy was a major force in the Republican party, especially among black conservatives. He was more of a moderate, but he was still conservative but he had a huge voice and a lot of influence. And it was this guy, Jackie Robinson, baseball legend. Let me pull him up here. There you go. Oh, that looks better. So he was actually friends with Richard Nixon for a while, but he kind of changed his tune a little bit. Now, he actually, after Nixon was elected, he wrote a letter to, to Senator Barry Goldwater, which is interesting because they butted heads a lot. So I'm wondering why he even bothered to write him. But in this letter, Jackie Robinson said, quote, picture yourself a black man standing before your television set hearing Strom Thurmond telling the country of his veto powers. I have yet to hear a denial of these allegations. I condemn riots and violence as vigorously as does Nixon, but my emphasis is on law and justice. For without the presence of justice, order is placed in jeopardy. Mr. Nixon impressed me in 1960, but in 1968, his dealing with Thurmond made a kingmaker made a kingmaker out of the former Democrat. Robinson wrote, "Because I am proud of my blackness and the progress we have made, I refuse to, to support this ticket." So essentially, Nixon turned him off by agreeing to work with Strom Thurmond, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But Robinson's letter reflected an earlier assessment of Nixon and other Republican leaders that he made in 1960. And in 1960, that was soon after he actually joined the party. But he pointed out that, that quote, uh, party officials, even those with the most laudable civil rights records, often fail to connect with African Americans. The trouble, he stated, was that politicians rarely visited predominantly black localities perhaps out of fear of alienating white Southerners and therefore had no idea of who African-Americans were and what they wanted. So Jackie Robinson is just the latest in a long line of black Republicans beating the Republican party over the head, telling them you've got to talk to black people. You can't keep avoiding black people, but the Republican party still keeps having this attitude of if we talk to black people, we'll lose white Southerners. This has happened all throughout the history and re remember, there's nothing new under, under the sun. <laughs> but it also shows that, like I said, there were always people within the Republican Party who were pushing it to do the right thing. Um, in Robinson's letter, it also reflected a recognition of another uh, reality. And that was the fact that Nixon and the Republican Party were going to continue, at least in part, Goldwater's pivot towards white Southerners even while still trying to appeal to African-Americans. So they're still doing this balancing act. And this is where the long Southern strategy comes in. Now, as I said previously, the, the resentment of white Southerners had continued growing after the passing of the Voting Rights Act. And South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond, he became kind of like the, the de facto figurehead of the Dixiecrat movement, which was seeking to maintain relevancy after being marginalized in the Democratic Party. Now, 
the Dixiecrat movement, lawmakers belonging to that movement, they were trying, they kept trying to invalidate the voting right, the voting rights acts, the, the voting rights act <laughs> through legal challenges. And uh, they used this legislation to drive a, a deeper wedge between the moderates and the segregationist factions of the party. So in the long Southern strategy, Maxwell and Shields wrote, therefore in the first post VRA election cycle, Thurman made a devil's pact with the GOP that over time altered American politics well beyond the Mason-Dixon line, the scope of which is just now coming into focus. The tale of the deal itself is well known, but the arc of the story stretches much further and wider than has been remembered. When George Wallace, the reactionary segregationist governor of Alabama, launched his third party presidential campaign in 1968, uh, parentheses, previously he sought the Democratic Party nomination in 1964 and would again in 1972 and 76. But after he launched his third, third party campaign in 1968, Thurman knew that Wallace would win the hardliners. But the thing is, is that in the Democratic Party, you had George Wallace, who was very much a segregationist and more on the extreme fringe end, end of that. Well, back then it wasn't so fringe. Um, but the choice was between Wallace and Vice President Hubert Humphrey, who was a very strong champion for civil rights. So what Thurman did is he adopted a strategy that involved uh, convincing Democrat moderates to switch to the Republican Party. Now, Democratic moderates, I'm talking about voters here, um, not necessarily legislators, but he believed that he can push some Democratic moderate voters to the Republicans. And this led to him setting up a meeting with Richard Nixon. And uh, many believe this is where they struck a deal. Um, according to the Long Southern Strategy, quote, he sat down with GOP hopeful Richard Nixon in an Atlanta motel where many believe Thurman traded his endorsement and, and campaign support for Nixon's benign neglect of civil rights enforcement, while others claim the two primarily discussed national security issues. Nobody knows exactly what was discussed there, but it seems that it, even if it wasn't in that meeting, at some point, they talked about this. Um, in June of 1968, Thurman publicly endorsed Nixon for president and helped him whip up delegate votes at the Republican National Convention when Nixon was facing a late challenge for the nomination from none other than Ronald Reagan. So obviously they had a conversation about this. It could have been at the hotel in Atlanta. It could have happened after. It could have happened multiple times, but it's clear that there was some synergy going on here, right? So in a conversation with Democrats who had recently converted to the GOP, the Senator said, quote, I know you want to vote for Reagan, the true conservative, but if Nixon becomes president, he has promised that he won't enforce either the Civil Rights or the Voting Rights Act. Stick with him. And they did stick with Nixon, and he won the nomination. Um, now, throughout his campaign, and even after he was president, he wanted to also appeal to Southern white voters, but he took a more subtle approach than Goldwater had. So uh, from the long Southern strategy, quote, Nixon had to find a way to reach alienated Southern whites who wanted to maintain their facade of moral patriotism to the nation at large while protecting the racial hierarchy at home. To allow many to save face, particularly in light of the intense media criticism of the region that had become part of the civil rights beat of most newspapers, Nixon's team adopted a racial code. Calls for the restoration of, quote, law and order, most famously translated to, into an end to protests and picketing and boycotts, and even a return to the racial status quo, while Nixon's war on drugs drove incarceration rates of Black Americans to historic heights. Now, that's been a claim that's been made on the left for quite a while. Now, there are people who were, were involved in this strategy who have admitted to doing this. It's not, I mean, it's not easy to tell how widespread this was, because the thing is, law and order can mean a lot of different things, right? But we do know that in some cases, this was meant for white Southerners to take it as we're going to stop these protests and we're not going to do civil rights and we're going to keep these, these Negroes from, from um, picketing and boycotting. Um, and that's where you get the term dog whistle, right? So that seems that that, that seems to have been a thing. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it, with acknowledging it. Um, but like I said, 
Nixon was a mixed bag when it came to the black community. And that's why some people find it hard to really assess where he stood. But after he won the 1968 election, he only got 15% of the black vote. Um, and so I looked at a piece from the Miami Herald, and this piece was about a documentary that was titled Nixon's The One. Um, the author, uh, Joe Lantigua, and the link to this is, is in the show note, but I'm going to quote Joe Lantigua, quote, the documentary details how Nixon promised Thurmond and other Southerners to support states' rights and to appoint only strict constructionists to the Supreme Code. I'm sorry, to the Supreme Court, code language for stalling desegregation. It speaks about how Nixon tapped into the sharp racial divisions in the country and the fear of change to reach those white Southern voters. Thurmond was on the stage with Nixon the night he accepted the nomination in 68. Soon after his election, Nixon moved to delay orders by federal judges aimed at segregation. However, the same author also acknowledges that Nixon would later prove less averse to black interests than some of his supporters may have hoped. But that did not change the South's allegiance to the GOP in presidential elections. Now, I agree, I disagree with that last part, the, the notion that, you know, the white Southerners allegiance to the Republican Party didn't change, even though Nixon wasn't as against black people as they would have liked. Um, and here's why. Uh, I mean, that, that point isn't exactly accurate. It wouldn't be until uh, President Bill Clinton's victory in 1992 that the GOP would actually dominate the South. So even in the 19, but even in the 1992 election, the GOP won the South, but even then, Democrats still maintained a hold on Southern states like Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, Georgia. Uh, but still, Lantigua is correct when he says that Nixon did not end up being as unfriendly to the black community as people like Thurman would have liked. As soon as Nixon became president, he started to put his black agenda into effect, and his black agenda was black capitalism. His initiative promised to promote black entrepreneurship and wealth attainment by focusing on the growth of, of black small businesses. Uh, one of his aides said, uh, quote, Everything we can do to increase minority business holdings, minority home ownership, and more jobs for minorities will in the long run mean more to the minorities and help increase our political favor. So in order to accomplish its goals, the Nixon administration created the Office of Minority Business Enterprises, or OMBE. He did this shortly after he took office in 1969, and he did it through an executive order, Executive Order 11458, if you want to look it up. Uh, now, we're going to go back to Republicans in the Black Vote, written by Michael K. Fontroy. In his book, he notes, quote, by creating the agency within an, an, an executive department, Nixon was able to bypass Congress and avoid many of the same conservatives who thwarted President Johnson's efforts to expand equal opportunity and affirmative action, unquote. Now, this initiative had a level of success. Um, it used Section 8A, uh, which suspended competitive bidding on federal contracts for small firms. So Fontroy writes, the decision to use 8A as an instrument to facilitate black capitalism paid dividends. Between 1969 and 1975, 8A procurement from minority firms grew from 9 million to 250 million. Also, during the period 1970 through 1975, purchases from minority businesses increased 165%, all the way up to 475 million. Now, of course, this in initiative it wasn't without criticism. There were people who weren't really on board with it. Uh, Fontroy also wrote, quote, many viewed the initiative as an attempt to segregate the national economy and limit support to activities in black communities, thereby leaving the rest of the economy larger and more lucrative to white entrepreneurs. Further, some critics believe that black capitalism would merely set up black businesses that would ultimately be taken over by larger white businesses, particularly in areas such as apparel manufacturing. Uh, Andrew Brimmer, then a member of the Federal Reserve Board, noted that black business people should not, quote, 
count on nationally oriented manufacturing firms leaving the Negro market to Negro entrepreneurs and call the initiative one of the worst digressions that has attracted attention and pulled substantial numbers of people off course. Now, I'm not sure how, how valid that criticism is. Uh, for what it's worth, Brimmer was a Democrat, so some of this may have been motivated, at least in part, on politics. But the fact remains, there are people who criticize this, um, and, it, and likely it had pros and cons to it. Uh, but Nixon was also responsible for continuing President Lyndon Johnson's work on affirmative action. Uh, he issued Executive Order 11478 in 1969, and this called for a, quote, unilateral affirmative action in all government employ uh, employment according to Smithsonian Magazine. Um, so really, I mean, the Nixon presidency was not quite as clear cut on race as some would have you believe. Um, an examination of his policies indicate that he was more pragmatic than principled, right? I mean, he he did what he needed to do to, to get elected and to get reelected, but that doesn't necessarily take away from what he was doing. Um, and while his support of black capitalism is laudable, uh, the war on drugs, it had a devastating impact on the black community, as most of you know. It had a horrible impact on the black community's ability to maintain families and to generate wealth. Um, but even Vox, which is not exactly a, a bastion for right-wing thought, right? Vox noted that his position on drugs may not have been motivated by race, but more by the fact that, quote, he personally despised drugs to the point that it's not surprising he would want to rid the world of them. So... A lot of people point to the war on drugs because of its disproportionate impact on the black community, despite the fact that studies have shown that black people don't commit drug crimes any more than any other race. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that when Nixon put this into practice, he was thinking, I can't wait for this to, to, to impact black people for even, a, and Vox is very far to the left. So I'm actually surprised that they acknowledge this. It very, I mean, it could have been motivated, motivated by racism, but we don't have evidence of that because like Vox said, he just hated drugs. Um, but the bottom line, <clears throat> the bottom line is that both Nixon and Goldwater implemented a strategy that changed the face of the Republican Party, and whether it, or not it was their intention, they carried on the legacy of the Lily White movement, which began decades before their time. Unfortunately, it seems like the GOP has never looked back. Um, but again, it is still important to note that since the beginning of the Lily White movement, there were always individuals, factions, and movements designed to push the former party of Lincoln back to its roots. And now we're, uh, we're going to go to our current era. Now, there was a lot that happened in between Nixon all the way up until now. I mean, I will do another video at some point about the GOP and how it changed un under Reagan, um, under H.W., under W, McCain, Romney. And by the way, just so I can take a dig at Mitt Romney, <laughs> uh, since Goldwater, no Republican presidential candidate has gotten more than 15% of the black vote. However, Mitt Romney was the only person other than Goldwater to get 6% of the black vote. That's all Goldwater got. That's all Mitt Romney got. So what does that tell you? You know, just a just a small digression I'll do here. <laughs> I, I've heard through you know certain channels that Mitt Romney avoided campaigning in black areas like the like like the plague. He didn't really reach out to black people at all. In fact, Paul Ryan, his running mate, love him or hate him, I get a lot of you don't like Paul Ryan, and I understand why. Establishment, I get it. But Paul Ryan was um a mentee of Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp mentored him, and he was a former um HUD secretary under HW. I believe, yeah, it was HW. And Jack Kemp was very serious about reaching the black community. He would go and speak at black events. He would speak in front of crowds of hundreds and thousands of black people. And he really wanted black outreach to be a thing. He was one of those individuals that I talked about that was always pushing back on this lily white um, takeover of the party. So Paul Ryan was under him and he had laid out this whole plan to reach the black community. And the Romney campaign shut him down. So no wonder he only got 6%. He didn't even try. Anyway, <laughs> um, I'm going to get into what's going on right now, but I'll check the chat really quick, see what you guys have to say. And thanks for sticking with me. I know it's, I mean, we're about, what, two hours into this? Yeah. You guys are awesome. 
Um, and just a reminder, please share this video. Appreciate it. But let's see what else we got here. You guys are pretty active in the chat here. I'm, I'm, you're having a, a rousing conversation. Um, <clears throat> I got to scroll all the way up. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay. Except Goldwater was opposing something that didn't exist yet. Affirmative action in the sense of preferential hiring wasn't established by the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, I'm not I'm not sure how it was established, but I know it was under Johnson and Nixon continued it. But I mean, when it comes to affirmative action, I understand the arguments on both sides of it right now. Back then, it kind of made sense. I mean, black people were very much disadvantaged. I mean, they were coming right out of Jim Crow. So I can see why that, that would be a thing. Um, <clears throat> hmm. Always short-sighted. Politics is downstream of culture. Politics draws the worst of people. Rod Stemler. You're right. And uh, unfortunately, the Republican Party sacrificed its role in the, court, in the culture, and we're paying for it right now. Um, what else we got? Rachel D, you missed the beginning. That's okay. You can watch the replay. <laughs> um, oh, this is interesting. I'm surprised to hear all this. My view of Nixon is based off what I heard him say on those tapes. Yeah. But uh, again, this doesn't justify it. But Nixon wasn't saying anything back then that everybody else wasn't saying. I mean, that, that's just that's just the way it was. Johnson was also a virulent racist, racist as well. He dropped the N-bomb on many occasions. So it didn't really matter what side you were on. They, that, that was just a thing. Um, yeah, so, so you want to ask me the hard questions. <laughs> Do you think libertarians are wrong when they say that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was a mistake because the government can't force private businesses not to discriminate? Again, you got to look at the time. I mean, back then, I understand the argument, but... Back then, I, I think if businesses were allowed to discriminate, it might have even set black people even back more. Then again, maybe they wouldn't have because the color that everybody cares about in reality is green. And the Jim, and Jim Crow laws were actually created to compel businesses to discriminate. There were a lot of business owners who didn't care, even if they were racist. They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't refuse business from black people because they wanted that money. So the Jim Crow laws had to force them to do it. That being said, there were still plenty, maybe even most, that just wanted to discriminate anyway, and they wanted it to be legal. So, I mean, back then, it, it made a lot of sense. Maybe we'll get to a point to where we just don't care anymore, but I don't, I don't think we'll ever repeal that part of the law. Um, and discrimination, I think that the free market would take care of it today, because guess what? Most people don't like racists. My concern would be if a black man happens to live in a part of the country that is still very much racist, and may have a hard time moving out of there, that would affect their lives as well. But it is a complicated issue. Um, let's see, what else we got? Um, <laughs> DB Strom Thurmond, my beloved South Carolina Senator. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think I'm gonna go ahead move on. Let's see what else we got here. Um, that's interesting. Both of those arguments about slavery and libertarians show a lack of understanding of libertarian philosophy. Slavery violates the non-aggression principle. Yeah, it does. Um, I know, who was it? Was it uh, Mises or somebody else who got in trouble for saying that if somebody voluntarily wanted to be a slave, then it was okay. But Compelling slavery was not. Very interesting. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, Thomas Sowell proved a lot about green being the more prevalent color, right? Yeah, I, I believe he did. I believe he did. And, and we can't ignore that part of it. I mean doesn't take away from the fact that 
the, the nation was virulently racist back then. Still has racism here today, but at the end of the day with most people, they want that money. They want to stack that paper. So uh, I'm going to keep going. Um, <clears throat> oh, whoops. Okay. So we're getting close to the end here. And again, thank you guys for sticking with me. And we're going to talk about the current era and what's going on now. I'm going to talk about the issues that the Republican Party and the conservative movement are facing now when it comes to winning more black votes. And this is very important. You know, whether you're a conservative watching this or you're on the left, this is important, especially if you are about black empowerment. Um, earlier in this presentation, I talked about a time when both parties had to compete for the black vote. That's gone now, which is one of the reasons why the black community does not have as much political power as I think it should. And we will not have that power until the percentage of black votes going towards Republicans and Democrats is as close to 50% as we can get it. It doesn't have to be 50%. It can be 40, 60, uh, 70, 30. I would prefer 60, 40. But when both parties have to actually compete, that, as far as, as, far as it concerns government, that is when things will change. Right now, the Democrats don't have to do anything because they have no competition. So let's talk about the current era. The, 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 the conservative movement and the Republican Party have gone through a, a distinct evolution since the days of Goldwater and Nixon. And when I say evolution, I don't mean that they changed their lily white leanings. They just kind of changed up the way they did it. Um, since the 1960s, the GOP has failed to put up a presidential candidate that was able to win more than 15% of the black vote, like I just said. Um, and in the major, and the majority of these candidates didn't even bother to try to woo African American voters. President Trump was the first Republican president in recent memory that made a concerted effort to win over uh, black voters, especially in the 2020 election. He increased his black support by 50%. That brought him to 12% of the black vote. Still not that great, but much better than what he did in um, in 2016. All he did was try. That's it. So think about that. President Trump, and, and I don't care how you guys feel about Trump, but President Trump with all of his flaws, with all of his uh, flubs when it comes to racial issues, with all of his mistakes, with his with all of his personality, with all of his, you know, appealing to a certain segment of white uh, Republicans, still managed to increase his black support significantly just by trying. Now, However you feel about Trump, that is significant. And you know me when it comes to Trump. If you follow me for long enough, you know I call balls and strike with the president, with President Trump. When he does something I like, I'll praise it. When he does something I don't like, I call it out. I can very much acknowledge that he was a very flawed per person and a flawed president. But even with those flaws, he was still able to increase his black support. And if Trump hadn't just been Trump all over the place, he could have increased it more. I don't believe the increase had anything to do with what I call Black Conservative Inc. If you follow me for long enough, you know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to name names here, but I'm talking about the Black Conservative Establishment, the Black commentators who uh, promote certain talking points that repel Black voters. If you notice, their rhetoric didn't sound anything like President Trump's when it came to the Black community. There's a reason for that. So just to continue here. The uh, the party, the GOP, has maintained the spirit of the Goldwater duck hunting argument. But the difference is that they're not as blunt about it as they were in days past. Um, if a presidential candidate or, or a major party leader publicly stated that the GOP should refrain from interacting with Black voters, it's, it wouldn't just turn off African Americans it would also turn off white voters as well. And this is something that a lot of us don't think about, but I talk about this at length. Um, so for this reason, since they don't want to turn off white voters, the GOP and the conservative movement seems to have adopted a strategy that involves putting up the illusion that they want to reach black voters while continuing to use a watered down version of the Goldwater approach. Now, we're going to go back to Michael K. Fontroy in his book, Republicans and the Black Vote. He is one of several, including myself, who have pointed this out. 
In his book, he says, quote, some even implicitly criticize black, well, he's talking about people on the right, people in the, in the, in the GOP and the conservative movement. He's saying, quote, some even implicitly criticize black voters for not being more, more open to supporting the GOP. Still others, given current political trends, suggest that the GOP should simply throw up its collective hands and spend no additional time or resources seeking black votes and focus more attention instead on Hispanic voters. Now he continues, quote, and then there are the cynics who wonder, GOP pronouncements notwithstanding, if Republicans really want black votes or just want to appear to want black votes as a way of showing racial moderation to center and center left voters. Making the policy changes necessary to get large numbers of African-American votes, after all, would alienate white conservatives, particularly those who fled the Democratic Party over its policy evolution. Such cynicism is heightened by the fact that GOP pronouncements wanting African-American votes are not always aimed at black America. They are often offered for the consumption of white middle-class suburban voters who agree with Republican economics, but don't feel comfortable voting for a party that has a reputation for apathy or worse towards African Americans and other minorities. So what he's saying here is that the GOP and the conservative movement have put up this, this act that they do. They act like they want black votes, which is why they'll put, which is why they will put forth certain media figures or influencers or, or, or members of the chattering class to make it appear as if they want to get black votes when in reality they don't. <clears throat> now, I, I don't agree with this assessment that trying to reach black voters would alienate, alienate white conservatives. Like I said, I think he comes from more of a left-wing bent, so he's not quite as charitable. I know for a fact that 90, 95, 99% of white conservatives, if I ask them right now if they would like to see more black people on the right, they're gonna say yes, because they do want that. And like I've said in previous videos, they're tired of being called racist all the time. And I don't think a lot of them want to be in a party that's just all white. And I think that the establishment GOP and the conservative Inc. types are here to, to, to make them believe that they're actually trying to reach black voters when really all they're doing is just talking to mostly white conservatives about the black community, but they're not talking to the black community. Um, so I'm gonna continue. Uh, the author's observation about conservative criticism of black Americans who are not open to giving the GOP is apt. Um, and actually, this criticism of black people is the foundation of one of the most popular tropes among the right-wing commentariat and the chattering class. It is the, it is the impetus behind the narrative that has been one of the most damaging to the prospect of GOP black outreach. And that is the Democrat plantation metaphor that I brought up earlier. Um, for decades, you've seen it, conservative media figures, influencers and politicians have referenced the false notion that black people refuse to vote for Republican candidates because they are mentally enslaved on a fictional democratic plantation and unable to think for themselves. I'm gonna go back to loneliness of the black Republican here. Dr. Leah Wright Rigur, she sums this up nicely. Uh, these are gonna be some long quotes, so bear with me. Quote, in contrast, White Republicans often heap gratuitous public praise on African-American members of the GOP, applauding them for having the gumption to leave the plantation politics of the Democratic Party, as Pat Buchanan did on CNN in 2011 while defending Herman Cain. This line of thinking stems from the flawed and simplistic belief that African-Americans have been brainwashed into voting for the Democratic Party and as a result, ignore the benefits of belonging to the GOP." Unquote. Now, as I mentioned, the plantation metaphor was first popularized by President Nixon uh, when he mentioned the trope during an interview. But since then, it's been used by both black and white Republicans alike, and become it's become a staple of conservative messaging on the black community. 
uh, Dr. Rigur continues, quote, the trope of the Democratic Party as a slave plantation has been a recurring feature of GOP rhetoric since at least 1968, when Richard Nixon mentioned it in an interview with Jet Magazine. Predating even this, Black Repu Republicans have used the phrase regularly since 1964. Such thinking is problematic, often condescending and occasionally even bigoted, insinuating that Democrats have bought the Black vote with government handouts and that African Americans are therefore unable to make their own rational political choices, thereby sidestepping the GOP's role in repelling black voters, unquote. Now, y'all sat through, through this presentation for over two hours. After everything that I've thrown at you, after all the history that I've gone over, does it really make sense to assume that black people vote Democrat because they are mentally enslaved? or because the Democrats bought their vote with government handouts. Does that really make rational sense? You cannot know the history of the Republican Party and the Black community and come to that conclusion unless you are dishonest or unless you are just not very bright. That is the problem with a lot of the punditry on the right. Again, I think most of them are just ignorant. They don't know what they don't know. They don't know any of this history. Because you're not going to find a lot of conservatives who are willing to lay this out like I just did. Especially today, because people just want to believe that the Republican Party did everything right. And the only time the Republicans are wrong is when they're not conservative enough. But as I've laid out here, the GOP has made horrible decisions when it's come to the black community. Now, some people might respond to this with what aboutism, right? Well, what about the Democrats? Yeah, the Democrats were worse. They actually did the slavery. I get it. However, the Republican Party wasn't much better. They they were they were great for about 15 years <laughs> after the Civil War, but after that, I've already shown you what's happened. So even a cursory examination of the history between the Republican Party and African Americans demonstrates that Dr. Rigur's assessment, it, it's fitting, right? The plantation trope is nothing more than a convenient way to, in my opinion, it's nothing more than a convenient way, a convenient way to trick white conservatives, most of whom would enjoy seeing more black people in the GOP, into believing that the party play that the Republican Party played little to no role in its loss of black voters. It seems to me to be designed to, to prevent their base from finding out the truth that the Republican Party deliberately abandoned the black vote, pushing black Americans into the eagerly awaiting arms of the Democrats. This didn't happen because Democrats offered socialism. Black people are not socialists. Last year, Pew, Pew Research did a study, found that 80 80 or 81% of black Americans identify either as moderates or as conservative. Actually, it was like 25 or 26% that identify as conservatives. And yet the Republican Party in a presidential election can't get more than 15%. Again, how much damage do you have to do that you alienate people who actually agree with you on foundational issues? That is how far the former party of Lincoln has sunk. But talking about the plantation, now, some people think that this is just a talking point. It's not. It's more than just a talking point. It The, the plantation metaphor has grown into a very pervasive mindset on the right when it comes to the black community. The democratic plantation trope is not just a talking point. It's an entire mindset that black, white, and otherwise uh, other conservatives have bought into over the past few decades because they haven't heard an opposing view. They haven't had anybody on the right who was willing to tell them the truth. Again, ignorance. You don't know what you don't know. Now, of course, there are some of these people who buy into this mindset because, frankly, they're racist. And we have to be willing to admit that and confront that. It doesn't mean that racism doesn't exist on the, on the Democrat side. We know what Malcolm X said about racism on both sides. So yeah, there is a lot of racism, racism on the Democrat side. They just hide it better. But this talking point 
And the fact that so many conservative influers, influencers and politicians and media figures on the right have been spouting this nonsense for decades, it's caused many conservatives of all races to view black Americans as lazy, mentally incompetent, and depraved individuals who wish to live on the government's largesse. You see the, de the, the debates I've been having over the past couple of weeks about black culture. A lot of white conservatives are ignorant about black culture. A lot of them think that it's what the media portrays it to be. Again, it, it's not stupidity, it's ignorance. A lot of them haven't really been around enough black people to know that normal black people are just normal black people. We're not Cardi B, we're not out in the streets twerking, we're not thugs. And when it's explained to them, and when they're shown that, I have seen with my own eyes, a lot of them will be like, you know, I, I never thought about it that way. And here's the thing. It may seem easy to people like us, or especially minorities, to say, well, you should have known. Who has time to research this stuff? That's what people, people like me are here for. That's what pundits are here for. We're supposed to actually be telling our audience the truth. The problem is that a lot of us lie. A lot of us don't know that we're lying. Some do. But the fact of the matter is most conservatives have been exposed to a deceptive message. I always reference my, my conversation with Ross Schumann, who I think is in the chat right now. And he told me his, uh, his viewpoint on black people changed when he got into the military and uh, he was uh, surrounded by a lot of black. <laughs> and then he realized that, it, you know, cause he had neighbors who were more normal, but based on the media, he just assumed that they were an exception to the rule. It wasn't until he was around more black people that he realized um, that black people weren't the way we are portrayed on media. He's still a racist though. I'm just kidding. I'm playing. <laughs> but uh, let me go on. The, the, so the legacy of the Lily White movement can easily be seen in today's conservative movement in that it still has not seen fit to reach out to the black community in an authentic way. Uh, so leaders, influencers, and politicians on the right over the past few decades, they've taken to talking about African-Americans rather than talking to African-Americans. You know, a lot of your influencers, they peddle stereotypes and other flawed talking points in front of their mostly white audience, which, like I said, is often ignorant of the black community and black culture. Ignorant meaning not stupid. It just means you don't know what you don't know. I'm going to keep repeating that so that people don't come, don't come back. I mean, you're trying to act like me saying ignorant is an attack. It's not an attack. I'm ignorant of stuff too. Um, but it's also important to remember that while they're talking about black people and not to black people, this black people are seeing this. Black people see this. And I'm not saying that there have never been individuals or groups in the party who have tried to reach out. Especially under Bush, there, there were people in the RNC who actually took this seriously. But the RNC has failed to support a sustained outreach to African Americans. It seems like they'll just try for a little while and then stop. Which, again, in my opinion, that's part of the illusion that they want to create. They can say, oh, no, we, we tried to reach black people, but they're too mentally enslaved or what, ha or what have you. It has rarely poured, the RNC has rarely poured resources into helping black Republican candidates win races at the local, state, and federal level. It is for this reason why black Republican rep representation in Congress, it's been abysmal. In, to, in, in the House of Representatives today, there are 58 black lawmakers. Of this number, only two are Republicans. And that would be Burgess Owens, who just won the, his election in Utah, and Byron Donalds, who won his election in Florida. The rest are Democrats. In the Senate, Tim Scott remains the only Republican lawmaker. Other than Scott, the last re black Republican senator was Edmund Brooke, who I mentioned earlier. He retired in 1979. So other than Tim Scott, we have not had a black Republican senator since 1979. Now, I'm going to be fair on this because the Democrats aren't much better. Uh, they only have two black senators in the upper chamber. So, but still... They have valued this. They have valued putting black people in positions of leadership more than, than the Republicans have. So now I'm going to talk about how we fix this. How do we reverse this damage? And it's not going to be easy, I'm telling you. I mean, this is, you know, over 100 years in the making. 
and the Republican Party broke trust. It's going to take years and years of authentic outreach to rebuild the trust that the former party of Lincoln broke. It's going to take an entire revamping of its messaging approach. It's going to require enough conservative influencers and commentators to buy into this. Politicians too. It's going to take a concerted effort, which is why I'm trying so hard to change as many minds as I can within the conservative movement. I don't need to convince everybody. We don't need to convince everybody. But we need to, to con convince enough high-profile individuals to take these steps and to change their strategy to make a difference. I want, you know, some people don't like me using sales analogies, but then my background is in sales. That's what I did for, for over a decade. I, I need to I need for the Republican Party to become a product that the black community wants to buy. Right now it's not, even though a lot of black people agree with a lot of Republican policies and ideology. We've got the policies, we've got the principles, we don't have the persuasion. So what do we need to do? First thing, or maybe not the first thing, I mean, because these things, these things can be done in tandem, but to put it simply, the right is gonna need to tear up its current messaging strategy, put it in the fireplace, douse it with gasoline, take a lighter, set it on fire. After the fire's out, take the ashes, to the nearest ocean and scatter it in the ocean, never to be seen or heard from again. Now, after saying good riddance to ridiculous plantation talk and demeaning stereotypes, we're gonna have to build a whole new effective and sincere outreach strategy from the ground. And emphasis on the word sincere, because we don't have that right now. Again, we have the illusion that we want black votes when in reality, we're putting forth black and white conservative faces who get clicks by demeaning black culture and the black community. The new improved approach, this would involve new conversations. These conversations would include, but are not limited to, honest conversations on race and racism in American society. We need honest conversations that avoid the exaggerations and alarmism of the left and also avoids the head in the sand mentality on the right. You guys have heard me talk about this a lot. Progressives want black people to believe that there's a Klansman behind every tree with a rope waiting to lynch the nearest black person. And they want us afraid that they, they blow it way out of proportion, but they dominate the narrative because the right always takes its cues from the left and they, have the, they always take the exact polar opposite. If high profile leftists came out tomorrow and they came out in opposition to throwing themselves off cliffs, we would have a lot of dead conservatives the next day because we always, we base our opinions on what the left is doing. We've got to stop doing that because while the left is being alarmist, while they're being deceptive, right wingers, conservatives have the opportunity to be the adult in the room and the adult in the room means when we're talking about issues of race, we form our opinions based on honest on an honest look at statistics, at studies, at stories, at, at 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 based on the things that we hear from the black community, and then we form our opinions based on that, not on just on opposing the left. If some people on the left might have an idea that's correct, we don't reject it just because it's on the left. Obviously, I'm joking about the whole throwing yourself off the cliff thing because you wouldn't throw yourself off a cliff just because the leftists said that they were against it, right? I mean, that'd be, that'd be silly. But we do that in a non-hyperbolic sense. Second, these conversations need to include discussions on how conservative policies and principles can benefit the Black community. Now, a lot of this conversation actually has happened. It just hasn't happened in earnest. You know, when it comes to education, we've got school choice. I think we need more than that. Let's have other conversations. What other conservative solutions would work? Third, these discussions need to include how the Republican Party can begin making inroads with African Americans. We need strategy, actual strategy, to enter into the Black community and start making inroads. And we need to recognize, like I said, this is going to be a marathon, marathon, not a split, not a sprint. The Lily White, the legacy of the Lily White movement, worked very hard to alienate Black voters again because they had opposition within the party. It's going to take a lot of hard work to undo the damage that they have done. 
But most of all, high profile conservatives, and again, I'm talking about influencers, politicians, leaders, uh, media figures, they've got to learn to listen to the black community and what they are saying. They need to engage with black leaders in predominantly black cities. And these leaders, I'm not talking about Al Sharpton, I'm not talking about Jesse Jackson, I'm talking about pastors, I'm talking about, about business owners, teachers, coaches, uh, people who run nonprofits, uh, people like that. People like Shaquem Maquette in South Carolina, I always bring him up because he's he's the prototype of what who I think we should be talking to. Um, I, a while ago last year, I spoke with Jimmy Kemp, the son of Jack Kemp, who I mentioned earlier. He, they've got an, uh, an organization which uh, Senator Tim Scott helped to found, and he's uh, like an honorary chairman, I believe. And what they do is called the Empower America Project, and they help to pro provide resources to minority and female candidates. And what he told me is exactly what I just told you. They coach their politicians on engaging with the right people. And they've gotten people elected, minorities. Um, also, politicians, influencers, media figures, we should be open to entering the world of black media and engaging in rational discourse. I've done this a number of times on Fox Soul. It's always a debate. I'm always outnumbered, but we're civil to one another, except for that debate with Roland Martin. But that doesn't count. It, it was his fault. <laughs> but in other conversations, I mean, the, 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 the conversations can get energetic, but we're all cool afterwards. And we can have rational conversations with one another. More of us need to do that. We have to figure out ways to focus on areas of commonality instead of only accentuating areas of disagreement. And we have to be willing to sell conservatism rather than just bashing the Democrats all the time. Um, now, I mentioned the Empower America project, but conservatives will also need to form and also support other conservative organizations that are designed to, to push minority candidates or really to, to push candidates that are running in predominantly minority areas or areas that have a high minority population. And these organizations should, should help them get funding or and help give them resources like the knowledge and other stuff that they'll need to run an effective campaign and create winning messages. Uh, this is especially important in states in which the local GOP is not interested in affecting positive change. Uh, Chicago comes to mind. Uh, I've heard some things about the local GOP there. Actually, I did it, uh, an interview with Devin Jones. Check that out on my, um, on my YouTube channel. He had a lot to say. He's a black Republican down there in Chicago, and uh, he wasn't running for office, but he was helping another candidate campaign, and he's got some stories. So check that out when you get a moment. Um, also, the Republican National Committee must finally start taking black outreach seriously. Instead of putting forth that illusion that I was talking about, the RNC needs to use their influence to get state and local Republican offices to start investing resources in winning over black voters. Again, this is tough because Republicans tend to think in the short term. The Democrats are great at playing the long game. People think that the upset in Georgia with the state voting for Trump and those two Senate in Warnock and um, what's his face, uh, Ossoff, they think that that just happened overnight. No, that was a 10 year effort, almost 10 years they spent to flip Georgia. We need to start thinking like that. We need to start thinking long term. Because the more we, because, you know, thinking short term, that ain't it, Chief. That, that ain't going to work anymore. Now, I talked about what high profile conservatives to do. But what about the rank and file conservatives, just regular folks? You guys can help, too. As a matter of fact, I think it, it'll be you that makes this happen. You may not have huge platforms and you may not wield tremendous influence. You may not have blue check marks on Twitter. But here's the thing. Um, if... There are enough of us rank and file folks who are willing to speak out and to speak to their leaders, even put pressure on them to change their approach. They will listen because they depend on you to maintain their level of influence and power. So if there are enough of black, white and other conservatives, everyday conservatives who are actually serious about changing minds on the right, then we can actually make a difference. Now, as I've said previously, there are too many conservative uh, media figures and influencers who don't take the black community seriously. And this leads to them making remarks and using rhetoric that 
reflect poorly on you. And I'm speaking to white and black conservatives, but mainly white since, you know, cons conservative movement is mostly white. I've told you before, they make you look like racist. They don't care because they're just there. They're just there to get the clicks. They're there to, you know, get the bag. And that's it. And again, I do believe a lot of them just don't understand the impact that their words are having. Some of them, I give the benefit of the doubt. Others, I don't. Either way, what they're saying reflects poorly on you. Whether it's fair or not, these people represent you. And when black people on the other side who are independents or Democrats, when they see the behavior that these people engage in, it turns them off. Trust me, they, they tell me this all the time. They're turned off because they believe that most white conservatives agree with the ridiculous and also a lot of times blatantly racist talking points that their pundits are using. But if more everyday people were willing to push back publicly against them, it will become easier to diminish the damage that they do. I mean, imagine if I'm talking to a black person and they say, well, that pundit said this, 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 and that was totally racist. Imagine if I was able to go pull up the tweet and say, well, yeah, but look at all these comments from white conservatives condemning what he said. Look at all that. Look at that. It would change something. See, the, the issue isn't the fact that these individuals are using these talking points. The issue is that from what I see, there aren't enough people pushing back on it. And, and I'm talking about other influencers and everyday people. You can't control what people say, but you can control what you say. Now, again, I'm not saying that you have to, you know, embrace cancel culture. That's not that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not saying that you have to go full SJW. But can you at least say, yeah, this is a bunch of crap. I don't agree with this. Or you're wrong. Or as a white conservative, I don't agree with this. Or as a black conservative, I don't agree with this. Is that hard? No. I mean, if you're already on social media, it just takes a second to type. Imagine if we had more of that. Um, but at the end of the day, these people do need to repu be repudiated. Now, again, a lot of them will, will probably be willing to come around. I, I think that that's true. Again, I think that they, they aren't aware of the damage that they're doing to the conservative movement. They, they don't really understand that they're actually helping the left do their jobs because they give the left ammo. They might as well be on the left as far as I'm concerned. But we do have to push back publicly against this. And I think more and more of us are. I'm seeing more of us react in the way that, that we should, but we just, we need more of that. Um, another way that everyday conservatives can help is to support the organizations that I'm talking about. Uh, help them, help them bring more minorities into the fold. If you can contribute time or money or both volunteer, or if you're, if you're loaded, hook them up. That would go a long way towards fixing the problem. Um, also, everyday conservatives, we need to start getting more involved. We need to apply pressure to the Republican Party to change its ways. And I'm talking local, state, and national. We need to apply pressure. If you can, get involved in your local uh, Republican Party. Uh, they're not going to change unless we force them to, right? It, it's, it's, it's like members of Congress. They're not going to care about their constituents unless they fear getting voted out. They're not going to alter their approach unless they fear a backlash from the right. But in order for that to happen, there has to be a backlash. Finally, we have to be willing to have tough conversations within the conservative movement. I mentioned the conversations earlier, but if you saw the the, the panel at CPAC that Maj Ture uh, moderated, he mentioned, he, he said this himself, we're going to have to have some hard conversations. Uh, on the right, we need to have a come to Jesus moment when it comes to the black community. We need to own the failures. They're not our failures. I mean, we, we didn't make Barry Goldwater do what he did, right? We weren't even alive back then, most of us. But instead of blaming Black people for their refusal to support Republicans, as conservatives, we have to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, take some personal responsibility, and we have to have the strength to be honest about why the party has failed for decades. That sounds a lot more painful than it actually is. When you remember that you didn't do it and that it was other people, it's much easier to accept that. I mean, people like me, I'm a conservative before I'm a Republican. That is why I feel free to criticize the Republican Party as much as I do. I'm, I'm not a turncoat. 
I still vote Republican. I just don't like him all the time. <laughs> but I, I'm a conservative. I want to see the conservative movement succeed. I want to see the black community succeed to succeed. And, you know, there's going to be some humility that has to be in order. This is going to be hard. We have to be willing to, to see where the conservative movement is still falling short. Um, and it's not going to be easy. Like I said, most conservatives have been lied to about the black community and black outreach for decades. This won't be easy because it involves changing attitudes about the black community that have been ingrained for decades. And we have to have a level of openness. We have to have a level of grace. Um, Kira Davis will be uh, glad to hear me say that. But uh, we, we, you know, I, sometimes I go harsh on the Republican Party because I want to get the attention. But you've also seen me use a little bit more grace and more patience in explaining things to people on our side because I see it as people who just don't know. Now, if they're not ignorant and they're just racist or if they're willfully, willfully ignorant, I don't have time for that. But at the same time, these conversations are necessary if we're going to see that pivot, if we're going to see that that change that we want to see on the right. Um, this is a reason why I did this presentation in the first place is because the truth, after I click that off button, the truth is going to be out there. Other people have covered this too, but I'm going to tell you right now, I ran searches on the Lily, Lily White movement and there's some articles on YouTube. There's nothing. And in the world of podcasting, there's nothing. I'm surprised that nobody on the left has really covered this because it's a good weapon, but I, this information will be out there. And this is information that we need to know. Um, and like I said, there's more to it than even what I talked about here. But we need to not shy away from what I laid out here. This is part of our history. If you're a Republican, this is part of the, the, the part of the, part of the GOP's history. There's a reason why I call it the former party of Lincoln. Some people don't like that, but you can't dispute that I'm right, can you? We are no longer the party of Lincoln and we haven't been for over a hundred years. And the guidelines that I just laid out here, this isn't comprehensive. As we continue to do this, more people will have more ideas and we have to be open to new ideas and diversity of thought when it comes to the black community. This is for this reason that I'll say things like, I'm, like when it comes to black conservative Inc, I'm not trying to remove their voices. I don't want their voices removed. Let the free market of ideas take, take care of what it needs to take care of. All I want to do is add more voices on. We have already seen that Black conservative Inc.'s approach has failed for over six decades. It's not going to work, y'all. It, it's never going to work. There will never be a time that we call black people, on, uh, black people on the left slaves and they somehow wake up and come on over. Why is that? Because they're not slaves. They're not mentally enslaved. They didn't go to the Democratic Party because they became socialists. They went to the Democratic Party because we kicked them out. We alienated them. We told them that we didn't want them. We made them feel unwanted. It's true. If you look at the panel that I did with, with Felicia Killings and Corey Frazier and, and Ross Schumann, Corey Frazier, he's open to conservatism, but he voted Biden. And it's because he doesn't feel welcome in the Republican Party. And I can't tell him that he should, even though I know that most white conservatives would embrace somebody like him. Even though I know that, I see the messaging and I, can, I can't fault him for feeling that way. Again, like I said earlier, the solution is not to blame the black community because I'm sorry. It's just it's not their fault that the Republican Party alienated them. And a lot of them don't even know the history that I just laid out. But I mean, like I said, the legacy of the Lily White movement is alive and well, and they can see that. So it's going to take every single one of us to try to make other conservatives understand the issue because we won't change until that happens. And like I've said, the conservative movement only has about 10, 20, maybe 30 years to change this around. And it has to start now because like I said, it's a marathon and not a sprint. If it doesn't, the Republican Party will become obsolete. I'm not saying it's going to disappear. It'll still be there in some form, maybe at some local levels or in some states. But we will never have the level of influence that we have had before. The demographics are changing. We have to do this. And even more dire is the fact that, you know, those of us who are against socialism and, and they're against the American 
government going further to the left. Well, guess what's going to happen if we don't get this together, if we don't start courting black voters and brown voters and Asians, we will be a socialist nation. Now, I mean, I know I've got people on the left watching this, you know, but you know where I come from. So that shouldn't surprise you. But we have to start taking this seriously because if not, the consequences are dire. And again, we have to start right now. So that is my presentation. Like I said, I'm going to be talking about this more often. And I there is are other areas that I have to cover that will be in bonus content that's going to be coming up soon. Um, I'm going to take a look at the chats here and see what's been going on before I sign off. Um, wow, almost three hours. Good Lord, this is the longest live stream I've ever done. Um, <laughs> let's see. <clears throat> well, you guys are very active. Okay. You know, the Republican establishment doesn't know how to appeal to white working class voters e either. That's true. Trump did. You know, again, whatever you, you love him, love him or hate him, the GOP needs to build on what Trump did because Trump had the right idea. Um, Tim Scott comes off as an establishment Republican. Uh, I don't agree. And here's why. An establishment Republican never would have pushed for any type of economic opportunity for black Americans. They wouldn't have pushed for opportunity zones. You can think whatever you want about opportunity zones. I get there's flaws in it. It's not as bad as what the left is saying. But he also wouldn't have pushed for criminal justice reform. He wouldn't have pushed for police reform. That is very unestablishment. <laughs> Let's see. Hmm. The alchemist. Being the token black GOP senator can be a fine line to straddle. You just have to avoid saying things that can trigger your voters or trigger your black American counterparts. I don't envy Tim Scott's position at all. It's got to be hard on him. <laughs> he gets it a lot from the black community. But I think that there are even people, black people on the left, that, that, are, that at least respect him. Um. Let's see. <laughs> okay, now you know you're wrong, ASAP King. Prager U is the new Comedy Central. <laughs> oh, man. No comment. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah, Prager, you used to be very informative, not anymore, though. You know, when he first came out with this, with, with, which was a long time ago, it had some decent content on it. I haven't watched it in a long time, so I don't, I mean, I, I've seen some of their headlines. I'm like, okay, come on, dude, really? But whatever. That's why we need more people like us putting information out there. Prager, Prager you would never do this presentation. Um, what else we got here? Okay. Mm, good point. The Alchemist. You always make some interesting points, The Alchemist. And I really hope that that's a reference to the book because that's one of my favorite books, The Alchemist. Anyway, the strange thing is that William Buckley had debates with James Baldwin as well as some of the leaders of the Black Panthers. Today's conservatives would rather be stuck in their bubble. Yeah. And, and I'm not really even a fan of William Buckley, but we we do need more of that. It doesn't even have to be a debate. Just have a conversation. I know a lot of people on the left won't come on conservative media, but we can go on theirs and we and but only talk to the ones that are actually coming in good faith. And there are people on the left who will come at you in good faith. Um, let's see. <laughs> Why the F have I not heard about you before? You're way better than most conservatives. There are more of us out here than you think. 
I'm not the only one. There are plenty. As a matter of fact, I would even go so far as to say that we might outnumber Black Conservative Inc. We may not have the huge platforms, but we're getting out there. Um, thank God for alternative media. Um, <laughs> Rachel D, great point. I keep asking white conservatives, if you know there's fake news on the left, and how can you be sure what you're basing your views of black people on is also accurate? That's true because I've bashed right-wing media, but left-wing media portrays black people horribly too. And that's something that Sonny Johnson has also said. So let me get this right. So you think it's fake news when they criticize Trump, but when they bash black culture and, and, and they portray black people as thugs, that's not fake news. You believe what they say blindly. And yes, I am talking about left-wing media. <laughs> All media has portrayed black people in a negative light unfairly. Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. so y'all are trying to, you know, hook up in the chat and hang out. That's cool. <laughs> if any of you come down to Awesome, uh, Awesome, Austin, let me know. <laughs> Drink some water. All right, fine. <clears throat> let's see. Okay. All right. So I, I think we're good there, but I think I'm going to sign off with that. But I, I really appreciate all of you coming. I have more people in here than I normally do. So it says that there's an interest in this topic. And um, like I said, I'm going to be following up with more content and I'm going to be having other people to talk about this. But um, I really appreciate you showing up. I appreciate you sharing the video and please share it again. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, again, if you want to support my work, you can uh, subscribe to my community on locals.com. Um, the, the link is in the show notes, uh, afreshperspective.locals.com. Or if you want to do a one-time donation, I'd really appreciate that too. You can see the links up here and also in the show notes. But if you feel like this was educational for you, if you enjoyed it, I'd really appreciate your support. Um, it wasn't easy to put this together. Like I said, it took about 24 hours, stretched out over a few days, obviously, to, to com compile all of this information and um, worked hard on it. So I hope I hope it really uh, resonated with you. And what's going to be important is seeing where we go from here. You know, what, what, what are we going to do? We, we need to have a lot more conversations, and I'm confident that we will. I, as much as I talk about the negative, in this presentation and even on social media, just know that I am encouraged. The reason why I go so hard and why I tend to go negative is because I want us to be better. But don't think that that means that I don't see the progress. I was just talking about this with somebody else a, a while ago when it comes to George Floyd. I know that there are a lot of conservatives out there defending Derek Chauvin, I get that. But the vast majority of conservatives are condemning what he did. If that had happened five or 10 years ago, it would have been a totally different story because we know how we are about the police, right? I mean, especially back then, you just always side with the police no matter what. I'm seeing, I'm seeing that there's a change coming and I'm loving it. Even Ahmaud Arbery. I mean, I was surprised because people were, people were mad. I saw white conservatives out there pissed off about what those men did. And again, I know that there are some that try to defend them. That's always going to be there, but... I, I was proud of y'all. <laughs> I was proud that you guys came out in full force condemning what happened. Um, so, yeah. So we should continue to be uh, encouraged because we are affecting change. I'll calculate a risk. Thanks. You hit my cash up. I appreciate that. Um, but, yeah, we'll, we'll have more of these conversations. And I'm starting to babble right now because I'm getting tired. So I think I'm just going to sign off. <laughs> so, again, thanks for showing up. And until next time. Keep your minds free.